Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode goes deep into the why and how of voting reform. If you're interested in politics, economics, collective decision-making, or philosophy, then this should be an exciting episode for you. If none of those gets you going, you might find this episode goes further into the details than you're looking for. We've recently attracted a few thousand new subscribers, so I just wanted to remind everyone that the blog post attached to every episode comes with links we've carefully chosen to help you achieve some level of expertise in the topics we cover. I strongly recommend checking them out. Also, in case you didn't know, the blog post for almost every episode comes with a full transcript of the conversation. I'll be honest that there are sometimes transcription errors in there, it's an awful lot to correct, often tens of thousands of words, but if you read much faster than you listen, you might prefer to consume the show that way. It's also helpful if you want to find a quote later on, or pull something out to share with other people. Finally, the blog post lists all of the topics that are covered, and give a list of key points from the episode. You'll find a link to the blog post in the text attached to the episode in your podcasting software. Without further ado, here's Aaron Hamlin. Today, I'm speaking with Aaron Hamlin. He's the executive director of the Center for Election Science, a US nonprofit which aims to fix broken government by helping the world use smarter election systems. CES recently received a $600,000 grant from the Open Philanthropy Project to scale up its efforts. In 2014, he also co-founded the Male Contraceptive Initiative, where he worked for three years. Before that, he completed graduate degrees in both education and public health before completing a JD and briefly practicing law. He's written for Deadspin, Independent Voter Network, and The Telegraph, and his work has been featured in Popular Mechanics, uh, National Public Radio, and Scientific American, among many others. Most importantly, he's a regular listener to the 80,000 Hours podcast. So uh, thanks for coming on the show, Aaron. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, We plan to focus on what good electoral reform would look like, uh, what the benefits might be, and whether it's at all realistic to achieve it. But first, describe for us the problem that you see yourself as trying to solve, Aaron. So... What we're looking at here is the voting method itself. And when I say, to get terminology out of the way, when I say voting method, what I mean is the information that you put on the ballot. Uh, So say choosing one, choosing as many as you want, ranking, scoring on a scale, and then what that information is done with. So how you're using that information to calculate a result. Uh, And that's called the voting method. Uh, So that's what we're mainly looking at when we're looking at these problems. Okay, so in the US and uh, the UK, the the voting system is basically that everyone ticks one name uh, and one name only. And in Australia, where I'm from, you have to number everyone in order of of preference. That's that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's right. So why hasn't everyone just picked the the best voting system already? Uh, What kind of why is this uh, an interesting and complicated issue? It's it's a tough issue because it's a tough problem to analyze. So like with a lot of things, you might find a nice, easy metric to use. And then given that metric, you can say, oh, well, we measured all these things according to this metric and this one came out on top. We'll just use this one. Well, with voting methods, there are a number of considerations to uh, look at. And no particular voting method is solid on all of these considerations. Uh, and these are considerations like uh, what kind of winner you get. Like, so if people on average tend to be happy with a particular winner, uh, do you get certain anomalies? How consistent is a method? When a method messes up, like how badly does it mess up? How frequently does that happen? Uh, how does it treat newcomers? So people that lose, even if they lose, are they given an accurate reflection of support? And here, this is kind of looking at single winner uh, method issues, but there are also a number of considerations in terms of metrics that you would consider for multi-member issues. So you might look at, for say, a multi-winner election method, does it give proportional outcomes? So for a certain percentage of the electorate, if they say 10% of them choose a particular party, say they choose 10%, for instance, does the number of elected officials roughly hit at that 10%? Or is it way off? Do they get no seats? Or do they get many more than they should? Um, So those are the types of considerations that you look at when you're dealing with whether a voting method is fair or whether it makes sense to use that method in a particular context. Um, And also things like uh, complexity, uh, what kind of ballot design does it have? Is it simple? Is it hard? So these are the types of things that we're looking at. Hmm. 
So uh, we'll, we'll come back to a whole lot of different voting systems and their various pros and cons in a minute. Uh, but but to make this more concrete, can you give us an example of where a bad voting system produced a, a clearly bad outcome? Yeah. So there's there's one kind of fun and a little bit uh, depressing election that happened in 1991 for the Louisiana gubernatorial election. So Louisiana, they use what's called a, a jungle primary, which means that you take all the candidates and you have them all run together. And then you take the top two and they go together in a runoff head to head. And in the 1991 election, there were uh, really three main contenders there within the jungle primary. Uh, You had Buddy Romer, he was a a moderate candidate and he was the incumbent governor. And you also had a couple others uh, who were a bit interesting characters One was Edwin Edwards, and Edwin Edwards, uh, he had served in government before and had had some allegations of bribery, and he he was kind of a shady character. And that was something that people were pretty aware of, that he was a bit of a shady character. And the other main frontrunner was a guy named David Duke, and David Duke uh, was known for being uh, a wizard in the uh, Ku Klux Klan. And so also an interesting character. And so you had these three candidates that were uh, running in this jungle primary. And within this, what the voter is doing is they, each voter is choosing just one candidate out of all these candidates. And here we're talking about three main front runners. There were some other candidates, but three that were getting the, the majority of the attention. And then the two candidates with the most votes uh, would go on to this runoff. And the funny thing is, Buddy Romer, the more moderate of the bunch, did not make it to the runoff. Instead, Edwin Edwards, the kind of corrupt politician, and David Duke, the Ku Klux Klansman, were the ones that made it to the runoff. So obviously, you and I uh, would have preferred the the compromise character. But like, why is it clear that that was just like an an error in the system uh, due due to a bad voting system rather than just voters having preferences that you and I don't like? So one way that we can get an idea that this wasn't right, aside from just it kind of smells of something that is not right, is that when they took polling information to look at how candidates would do head to head, against each other, uh, Buddy Romer versus Edwin Edwards, uh, Buddy Romer wins, and Buddy Romer versus David Duke, Buddy Romer wins. So if Buddy Romer went against either of these two head-to-head, he would have won easily. But the mere fact that it was a three-way race meant that he was knocked out. And that was because of, of vote splitting, I guess, that some of his uh, like, or some of the people who liked him moderately were taken away in the first round to, to the other two candidates? That's right. So an interesting theme that comes up with a a voting method, when you're only dealing with two candidates, the voting method doesn't matter so much, but it becomes really important when you have more than two candidates. Uh, Then the voting method that you choose becomes really important. And so there's an interesting phenomenon that can occur when you have a three-way race where all three are kind of competitive and there's a moderate candidate. There's this phenomenon called the center squeeze effect which has the candidate in the middle have their vote split on either side. So here what you're essentially having is first choice preferences being split. And so the person in the middle gets split from the person on the right and the person on the left. And they can just get a sliver of the vote, even though they appeal to the broadest breadth of the electorate. And, and that wouldn't an election against every other candidate one on one. Yes. So uh, is this a common occurrence? Is it, is it common for the voting system to produce suboptimal outcomes or even disastrous outcomes, as in this case? Uh, it tends to occur more often when you have a competitive election where there are a number of candidates. So primaries are likely one area where you would see that because you have a lot of candidates that they tend to have a lot of similarities and overlap. And so you can have more of this vote spring type effect going on. And I guess an effect of the potential for vote splitting is that in, in, in these plurality voting systems where just the, uh, the candidate with the most um, first preferences wins is that you tend to get consolidation into just two parties because every side wants to make sure that their vote is never split because that greatly weakens their chances. So there's a, there's a kind of a separate reason why you get two parties 
as a consequence of a particular voting method. And that goes to a political science idea uh, called Diverge's Law. And Diverge's Law uh, is kind of a predictor for the number of parties based on the voting method. And it looks at two factors. Uh, one is the amount of support that a particular candidate or party needs in order to get elected. And when you're talking about a single winner election, uh, that amount of support is more than anyone else. And so that kind of raises the threshold so that it makes it difficult for third parties or independents to can hit that support. And then the other factor that Diverge's Law looks at is whether it's possible for a voter to kind of fearlessly be able to support their honest favorite, even if that person doesn't look like they're going to do particularly well. And so you really need that in order to give third party candidates and these other uh, candidates the ability to increase their support. Because if you have, if you're as a, as a voter, if you're looking at a third party or an independent and you're saying, well, I don't think they're going to do very well, you're likely not going to vote for them. You want your vote to be effectual. So you're likely going to choose uh, amongst the front runners. But if you have a voting method that doesn't let you do that and it kind of forces your hand to say, vote for the lesser of two evils, well, now you've got a problem and third parties are going to have a problem too. So if you're able to address at least one of these two factors, that is being able to have a kind of a lower threshold to be able to get in there, which say proportional voting methods do, or you have a voting method that allows you to work on supporting your honest favorite, uh, that's also going to help for allowing for another party to, to thrive. So Diverge's Law is a, a little bit of a misnomer in some ways. It really acts as a, a, a large predictor. But So there are other types of factors that can be predictive in terms of whether you're going to have more than two parties, but the voting method is by and large a predominant factor. Hmm. So uh, just before we go into voting theory in detail, which uh, countries and kinds of elections does the Center for Election Science think about? Is it, is it just government elections in, in the US or is your scope broader than that? Uh, well, we, we think about voting methods all over. And here we, we, we spend a, a good amount of time uh, looking at single winner voting methods. And right now that's predominantly our focus. Although we also uh, look at, to some degree, multi-winner uh, methods. So there are a number of countries that use better multi-winner methods, arguably, than, than the U.S. and uh, some other countries that do elections similar to how we do. Um, so, for instance, you have countries like Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, Norway. They use a lot of proportional methods. They also use some things like uh, leveling seats, which makes it so that you can have a certain threshold, say like 5%, in order to make it so that uh, a party needs to hit that threshold of support in order to get anyone uh, elected for a particular seat. And uh, some of these countries that use proportional methods, you can use features like leveling seats to make it so that if the number of people within a party are maybe off compared to what it should be, they can add extra seats to kind of even that out to make sure that it's more proportional than it otherwise would be. Uh, so you have some countries like that that use uh, nice features in order to uh, lead towards more uh, proportional outcomes. But when we're talking in the single winner space, so things like executive offices, like mayor, governor, president, those types of things, we see a really a lot of bad voting methods all around across the world. So we see first past the post uh, used quite a lot. So when you're only choosing one person um, and the person with the most votes wins, sometimes we see a runoff, which is was exampled with the uh, 1991 Louisiana gubernatorial election and getting uh, David Duke and uh, Edwin Edwards into the runoff, which is a spoiler if you haven't read through, uh, Edwin Edwards actually beat David Duke and interestingly enough is going and running again in, in other elections, not successfully, but attempting to run in other elections. So even to the kind of examples that even countries that are using runoffs, like there's still some serious issues with using runoffs. And we know that there are voting methods, single winner voting methods that get around some of these issues. And yet we're still seeing a lot of governments, even newer governments that are kind of revisiting their, their systems or creating new systems. They're still using 
these really bad voting methods, either for pass to post or a runoff system. And even if they're doing something, say, like instant runoff voting, that's still getting into some of the issues that we see with a traditional runoff system. It's just kind of simulating that process. All right, let's talk about the various uh, reform options. So most jurisdictions in in the US and the UK just use first past the post voting. So you get to vote for one candidate and the candidate with the most uh, first preferences wins. What are the various different options that they could have for, you know, reducing opportunities for tactical voting and uh, reflecting the actual preferences that the electorate has rather than having perverse outcomes like uh, a candidate that would beat every other candidate one on one uh, failing to win the election? So a, a really simple way that we tend to uh, like and we, and we push as an organization for single winner government elections is a voting method called approval voting. And with approval voting, what you do is you merely select as many candidates as you want, not just one. If you want to choose just one, you can do that, but you have the option to select as many as you want. And we're not talking about ranking. We're talking about merely choosing as many as you want. And then the calculation just being summative like it normally would be. And that that particular method is really simple, which is nice when you can use a simple method that gives you the types of outcomes and behavior that you want. It's normally pretty good to go with that method. And it is also robust to a lot of anomalies that you wouldn't like to have occur. So uh, with vote splitting, it's very robust to vote splitting. If you have similar candidates that are running, because people can choose multiple candidates at the same time, it helps to guard against that. Uh, it also has a really nice property to it, uh, which is nice for independents and third parties. And that is that with approval voting, when you can choose as many candidates as you want, you can always put your full support behind your honest favorite candidate. So what that means is, say there's an independent or third party candidate that you really like, but you're looking at them and you think, oh, this person is never going to win. Uh, what I should really be doing is looking just among the, the top two competitive candidates, maybe the, the, the major parties, and choose a lesser of the two evils among them. But with approval voting, you don't have to do that. You can kind of have your cake and eat it too. So under an approval voting election, what you can do is you can support that third party or independent candidate that you really like. And in addition to that, if it looks like that candidate maybe is not going to be able to take on one of the other leaders and really dominate, and it looks like you maybe want to hedge your bets with one of the other two front runners, what you can do is you can choose the lesser two evils in addition to supporting your honest favorite. And that makes a big difference because now that third party or independent candidate, that candidate can build their support over time. Also, it means that they can't be marginalized the same way. So if we're using first past the post or plurality voting when you can only choose one candidate, third parties and independents get an artificially low amount of support. Not only do they typically lose, but they get an artificially low amount of support, which means that they are marginalized unfairly. So they can bring good ideas to the table that are popular with people, but because they're perceived to be a losing candidate, they just simply don't get that support under priority voting. But with approval voting, we see time and again through research and through other polling that these candidates get a much more accurate reflection of support. And that's exciting because that means when they bring these good ideas to the table, they don't get marginalized unfairly. Hmm. Okay, so approval voting avoids the vote splitting uh, perversity and it uh, means that candidates are more likely to get a kind of an accurate reflection of how much the electorate likes them in general in the, in their vote share. And, and I know that approval voting is kind of your, your preferred favorite, and it seems to be that the voting system that the Center for Election Science is, is mostly promoting at the moment. Uh, but what, what are the biggest uh, downsides of that system, and uh, are there any alternatives that we should be considering as well? Yeah, so every voting method has anomalies that can occur with it. So there are theorems out there, like the gibbert seberoth theorem, uh, which says that every voting method can have some kind of tactical voting vulnerability, which so tactical voting, that's when a voter expresses information on their ballot in a way that isn't accurate for their actual preferences, but they do it because voting that way optimizes the likelihood of the outcome that they want to see. Uh, So with approval voting, probably one of its heaviest criticisms is that it can tend to cause some people to choose only one candidate because they don't want to create extra competition for that candidate. 
And you can have an approval voting election where a lot of people just choose one candidate. But we would argue that that's not something that's fatal. Really, what's important here is that when it's important for a voter to choose more than one candidate, that they have that ability. And that when they don't have that ability, then it becomes a real issue. So, for instance, there may be within an election, and a lot of people maybe don't care about some of the non-front runners. Uh, maybe they just simply aren't very good candidates. And in that kind of circumstance, maybe they only choose one candidate, and that's not a big deal. Or say your honest favorite candidate is a front runner, and you don't want anyone competing with that candidate, and there's really no one else that you kind of have to hedge your bets against. Then in that case, it makes sense to choose only one candidate. And another interesting thing here is that even when a lot of people uh, say choose only one candidate, having just a portion of people, say 10 or 15 percent, choose more than one candidate can still make a big difference. So, so 10 to 15 percent within an election, that can easily mean the difference between a win and a loss or one candidate winning versus another candidate winning. Uh, so it can change the outcome of an election even when a few number of voters decide to choose more than one candidate. The other issue that comes up is even when you have a lot of people choosing only one candidate, it can still make a big difference with the people that choose multiple candidates in terms of how that reflection of support is given for third parties and independents. Hmm. Okay. And I guess for, for those who choose to just vote for one candidate, they're probably no worse off than they would have been if, if they could only vote for one candidate. They just also have the option of expressing a wider range of preferences as well. That's right. There's no harm for them for having that option. Hmm. So, so is that really the, the greatest weakness of, of approval voting? Are, are there no kind of situations where you have a particular kind of allocation of support between different candidates where a Condorcet winner, that, that is a candidate that would win in a one-on-one -on -one fight with every other candidate, could lose in approval voting? Or is, is that just extremely rare? Uh, with approval voting, one of its uh, nice properties is that it tends to elect what's called a Condorcet winner. And as a, a recap for clarity, a Condorcet winner is a candidate who can beat every other candidate head to head if it was just between those two candidates. So the candidate that can do that with every other candidate is a Condorcet winner. And another interesting thing about that is that a Condorcet winner does not always exist, just like a candidate with majority support does not always exist. Interesting. Okay. But approval voting would, will almost always choose one if, if, if one does exist. Correct. Approval voting is very good at electing a Condorcet winner. It's not to say that it will do it every single time because, like I said, uh, voting methods aren't good at being able to fulfill a lot of certain criteria in an absolute sense, but they can perform uh, really well on a particular criterion. Yeah. So, so you said approval voting is a little bit vulnerable to tactical uh, voting where someone might only vote for one candidate, kind of for the same strategic reasons that they might vote for a particular candidate uh, in, in first past the post voting. But does it violate any of the other, uh, or can it, can it violate any of the other ideals of, of a voting system? Uh, so part of the rationale for looking at choosing only one candidate would be a criterion called later no harm, uh, which gets back to the idea of uh, you don't want to create extra competition for your favorite candidate. So for, for instance, let's look at kind of the worst case scenario for an approval voting election, where as an individual voter, you see that one of your favorites is, is in the lead, and there are a couple other competitors, one you really would hate to see get elected, and another you would just kind of be all right with. And so there, to kind of avoid the catastrophic uh, result, you may choose the candidate that uh, has a lot of commonality with what your ideals are and the policies, but maybe doesn't quite fit the same way that your favorite candidate does. So there, like you may choose that candidate, and that candidate may wind up winning uh, as, as a consequence. And so there, at the individual level, you have a failure where you just kind of get a compromised candidate. But the, the interesting thing about that is that at the individual level, there may be a little bit of a, of a loss there. But by choosing a compromised candidate, that's something that while there may be a little bit of a loss at the individual level, at the group level, that tends to be a candidate that appeals to the broadest base. And another instance here is that here, when, when we're talking about kind of a, of, a, of a failure at the individual level with approval voting, the failure is not an enormous one. We're talking about not maybe not getting your favorite candidate, but uh, as a result of the way that you vote, maybe getting 
uh, a compromise candidate and compare that to the type of loss that you might see in another type of voting method where instead of by the way that you express your ballot, instead of getting maybe your favorite candidate, you get a really terrible outcome, which is possible with other voting methods. The kind of worst case scenario that you see with an approval voting election is that at the individual level, you may get a compromise candidate, which may not be a terrible deal for the election at the group level. Okay. So it fails more gracefully. Uh, so before we go on to talk about uh, other voting systems, uh, do you want to just um, respond to the uh, common objection that approval voting and probably probably everything else we're going to discuss here uh, allows people to, to, to vote more than once, which I think is a, is a common complaint among people who are used to first past the post voting where you only get to vote for one candidate? Yeah. So the... I think the, the, the idea there is that the criticism is that some voting methods may violate uh, what's called one person, one vote. And the, the concept behind one person, one vote is that the weight of one person's ballot counts as more than others in an unfair way. And as a quick spoiler, they don't violate one person, one vote. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the concept of one person, one vote goes back to uh, some Supreme Court decisions in, uh, in the U.S., like Baker versus Carr, Reynolds versus Sims. And they were looking at cases where you'd have a district that has way fewer voters than another district, and yet the uh, smaller district would get the same number of seats, uh, which was weird, which meant that, say, like, if uh, one district had a population that was 10 times smaller than another, essentially the weight of those people's vote within that smaller district was 10 times greater. And that's not what is going on with these voting methods. So uh, for instance, say we have six candidates, uh, you really like one candidate uh, and we're using an approval voting election and you choose that one candidate and say, I like four other candidates um, that aren't that one candidate that you like, and I choose all four of those. Well, my ballot doesn't count for four times as much as your ballot does, and neither of the people that we voted for, if we just count our two ballots, are in the lead over the other. So neither one of us is getting an extra unfair weight as a result of using a particular voting method. Hmm. I suppose uh, one, one way of explaining it would be um, in approval voting, if, if you had uh, an election with six different candidates, if you voted for all six of them, in a sense, you got six votes. But of course, you won't change the outcome at all because you voted for every single one and you, and you haven't distinguished between them. And, and I suppose another way to think about it might be that everyone gets the same number of votes. They get six votes. They get to decide whether they say yay or nay to six different candidates. Yeah, that's right. Those are other explanations that also kind of get at the, the, the same underlining idea there. And there are a number of elections that we use with current voting methods that allow us to uh, express the number of uh, votes for candidates in a different ways. So, for instance, in a lot of U.S. elections for city councils, for instance, we use what's called a block plurality voting, uh, where, say, there are five people being elected and, say, there are 10 candidates or something, a voter would be told that they can vote for no greater than five candidates. And you could have somebody that chooses five candidates out of those 10. You could have another person that chooses three candidates out of those 10. And here you have a different number of candidates being voted for on different ballots, but neither voter is at a disadvantage merely because of the way that they decided to express their vote given the voting method. And that's something that we already use right now. This makes me think, if, if I was voting in, in an election with approval voting uh, and, and there were six candidates, how do I decide how many to vote for? I mean, I, I could, so obviously I don't want to vote for all six of them, that, that's pointless. I could vote for one. And so I just like, I'm, I'm boost the one that I, that I most like. But is, is there some kind of uh, medium that uh, is, is kind of optimal from a strategic point of view? Yeah. So one kind of simple heuristic that you could use is you could say, okay, well, who's likely to win here? Like, who are the front runners here? And then uh, among the front runners, you would take a compromise. You, you would take the candidate among the front runners that you like. And then in addition to choosing that candidate, you could choose everyone else that you liked more than that candidate too, uh, which would kind of take the place of uh, other candidates that you really like, but maybe aren't as viable. So you could look at it that way, such as like choosing your favorite as another way. And then looking at, is there anyone else that is likely to win that you would also find uh, acceptable who is maybe not competing with your favorite? And you're also considering things like, 
is there somebody else that you really don't like? And is there perhaps someone that you may be able to hedge your bets with uh, to keep that other person from winning? Which really is not too far away from the way that we do it in current elections in terms of the analysis. So like say that there's an independent or third party candidate that you like, normally you can't vote for that person, but you're kind of looking at ways to hedge your bets against the other person that you don't like. So you're really doing the same scenario, only in addition to hedging your bets appropriately, you're also being able to offer that honest expression of support and really choosing the candidates that align with, with your viewpoint. Okay, so let's move on to, to other voting systems now. I'm from Australia, where we have a system called a single transferable vote, I think also called an instant runoff or, or in the UK or alternative vote. Do you want to just uh, describe that one and then uh, explain its kind of pros and cons and maybe why, why you haven't chosen to campaign in favor of that voting system? Sure. And, and I would, off, I would uh, offer a, a quick highlight of a, of a nuance, which is that instant runoff voting is really a different voting method than single transferable vote. So when we talk about something like instant runoff voting, we're talking about a single winner voting method. Whereas when we're talking about single transferable vote, we're talking about a multi-winner voting method. They have a lot of similarities with their, their algorithm. And you can kind of plop one on the other within a particular circumstance and get a, the, the same result. But it's generally good practice to separate single winner voting methods and multi winner voting methods. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So I guess we use instant runoff for our lower house, our house of representatives, where we have single member districts. And then I guess single transferable vote for our upper house, we each state represent uh, like seven, seven different uh, candidates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so what are the pros and cons of that, of that kind of approach in general? So with instant runoff voting, I think kind of intuitively, it seems like you're offering more information and you, you are offering more information. And part of the, the issue with that is that within the, the algorithm of instant runoff voting, you are uh, only looking at one part of the ballot at any one point. So like the algorithm that, that is going through, it's only looking at the first choice preferences at any one point. And to kind of step back for a moment to highlight like what's going on with instant runoff voting. The the algorithm is saying, okay, first the voter is ranking their preferences from their first to their least uh, preferred candidate. Uh, the algorithm is saying, okay, does anyone have more than half of the first choice preferences among all these candidates? If yes, then you have your winner there. If not, what will happen is you look at the, uh, the candidate who has the least number of first choice preferences, that candidate is eliminated and you look at that the ballots that voted for that candidate as their top preference, and then you look to their next preference. And then the next preference is now treated as the first preference. And then you go through, run that algorithm again and see if anyone has a number of first choice preferences that's greater than half. If yes, you have a winner. If not, you keep going through that until you do. And so there, like that's kind of a, an element of, of an issue with instant runoff voting to begin with, and that it's kind of complicated. You have a number of rounds that are going on there, and being able to keep track of all those vote transfers between rounds can be kind of complicated. So with the expression part, it seems like you're providing a lot of information, but the algorithm is only looking at first choice preferences at any one point, and it may not even look at the rest of your ballot. So even though you provided all this information, the algorithm may not even look at the rest of your ballot at all during the election given what happens in the election. So that's kind of one part in that it kind of intuitively feels like you're providing all this information, but we, we can't forget that the voting method, it has multiple components to it. One component is the information that you're providing. The other com component though is what is the algorithm for that voting method doing with that information? And so, so that's one element. You can also have things like kind of anomalies that can occur, which and to be fair, like anomalies can occur with lots of different voting methods. So you can have it so that you rank a, a candidate as better and that causes that candidate to lose. Uh, you can uh, rank your favorite candidate as first and that can wind up harming you and leading to a worse outcome. Um, so that's an issue that we kind of see with uh, first past the post already with when we choose our honest favorite causing a, an undesirable outcome to occur. And even though like at the moment, like kind of highlighting some of the issues with instant runoff voting, it should be clear that first past the post voting or plurality voting is really awful. We, we have our issues with instant runoff voting, but plurality voting is 
worse than instrument offbooting. So as a caveat, it's, it's always important to kind of put that out there in terms of making sure that we always know where the bullseye is and that the picture first past the post is always on that bullseye. Okay. So from my experience in Australia, a single transferable voting seems to work reasonably well. Uh, I think that the case where you can get uh, like the most perverse outcome is where you want your second favorite candidate, say, to get removed sooner uh, so that then their votes will be just dist- like their, their second preferences will be distributed among other candidates. And so you take a candidate who you, you like actually preference second and put them last so that they're more likely to get eliminated early and then that those votes go to go to another candidate that you might prefer a bit more. So so there's there's some room for tactical voting though I think because Australia's system is pretty two party heavy that that happens fairly rarely. And in the case where you're with multi member districts in the Senate that there's this quite regular occurrence where the seventh member that's elected in each state uh, is is quite random because that often they're cobbling together a bunch of like votes for tiny parties. So we've had, you know, members elected to the Senate from like the motorist enthusiast party that got like well under 1% of the vote because they managed to cobble together like preferences from tons of uh, micro parties uh, before they went on to the major parties. But by and large, it seems seems to work okay. Although, especially in, in the Senate, uh, often people have to vote if they want to vote for, uh, or it, actually in, in the past, if they wanted their vote to count and they didn't want to give their preferences to, to the parties to decide themselves, they would often have to number like 100 different candidates, which, which I've actually had to do. Uh, recently, that's been changed. So you can choose how many candidates you want to vote for and, and your vote just expires if if there's no further preferences so once it's once it's removed. But yeah, it's it's interesting to me that kind of instant runoff and single transferable vote, they seem to be more popular methods around the world than approval voting. But, but you seem to think that approval voting is usually a superior system. Yeah. And, and so instant runoff voting and single transferable vote have had some advantages. Partly, they, the academic history for them and initial use was a lot earlier than with the uh, um, kind of modern use of approval voting. So the academic literature on approval voting really began in the late 1970s with uh, Stephen Brams and Peter Fishburne. Uh, they were kind of, uh, while there were some other people that looked at approval voting and identified the voting method independently, the academic research really began in the late 1970s and then went from there. Um, and so these other voting methods really just really had a head start. And from that head start, they've been able to see more implementation. But uh, they also had that initial gap too from when the initial work is done on the method. Uh, and then you have that kind of gap between when you see the initial use and then successions from there. So the the UK considered uh, switching to um, single transferable vote, which they called alternative vote. And I think 2012, 2013, they, they, they had an, an election about that. And they pretty decisively decided not to switch their, their voting system. Uh, do, do you know what the reason for that was? And, and does this kind of indicate why it might be hard to get to get any switch in, in voting systems? Um, I'm not quite as familiar with uh, that particular campaign. Uh, so it's going to be difficult for me to go on the, the nuances of that. But I can talk a, a bit about some of the uh, campaigns in the U.S. Uh, for alternative voting methods uh, that look at instant runoff voting, for instance. Yeah, that, that would be great. So in the U.S., uh, instant runoff voting has been implemented in a number of cities at the local level. And then it's also been more recently pushed at the uh, state level. And and that's largely been successful. Um, so there, the kind of idea there, and this has been used previously with other types of uh, turn of voting methods uh, earlier in the 19th century. So this kind of strategy has been taken up uh, again to, to push instant runoff voting. So the way that's been done is by using ballot initiatives uh, at the local level. And that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and one of the reasons it makes a lot of sense is because if you are elected under a certain voting method, you really don't want to have another voting method come along that could risk your re-election. You'd really like to have it be the same voting method that got you elected in the first place. And so as a consequence, there there's a conflict of interest with people who are already elected choosing the voting method that's going to be electing them in the future. And so to get around this conflict of interest, uh, a ballot measure is a good way to... to Take it directly to the public. Right, and circumvent that issue. And so we've seen over a dozen cities use and implement uh, instant runoff voting. Uh, And it's been pretty successful in getting it initiated, although there have been some repeals 
uh, in some cities. And part of that is you have some complexities that come up with that particular voting method. You can see some anomalies. And when that happens, people can get confused. And so sometimes like you just get the, the wrong result and people aren't happy about that. And as a consequence, it's also been repealed in certain cities as well. So are there any alternatives, uh, alternative systems that would be appropriate under, under particular circumstances that, that we should also consider? Uh, yeah. So we like approval voting for single winner government elections, uh, particularly here in the U.S., because uh, one is very simple. And so you don't get a big discrepancy between the voting method that we're currently using and the proposal. And it tends to avoid a lot of anomalies, tends to get you good results. But there are uh, other situations where uh, maybe we want to use a different voting method and maybe that makes sense. So for instance, uh, voting takes place in a number of different types of contexts. And if you're using, say, a voting method where there aren't a whole lot of voters, say like 20 or 30 or something, and you're making a group decision, maybe something like score voting makes sense. Uh, So for clarity, with score voting, what you're doing is you are scoring each candidate on a scale, say zero to five, and the candidate with the highest score on average is the candidate that wins. So it's a bit like how you review things on Amazon or or IMDb. Yeah, yeah, that's the, the... kind of nuances within the algorithm may be a little bit different, but that's the idea. That's certainly the expression element that's occurring. And so one of the reasons why something like score voting is is, uh, more appropriate when you have a small amount of voters is because you really, when you're voting and you're providing information, it's kind kind of a sampling. And when you have not a whole lot of people or, or voters, then you have, uh, from a statistical point of view, a lot of random error. And with score voting, because you have more iterations of expression along a scale, that sensitivity actually reduces that, that error. So you can have, so you're more likely to hit the result that is good for the group. Whereas with approval voting, when you want to have, say, a small number of people, you may have an issue there because the expression element doesn't have a lot of sensitivity. So with score voting, you're getting really a lot of the features of approval voting, and it's uh, it's still an additive uh, voting method because um, you're just taking the average or s- simply summing the scores. You, you get a lot of the, the same features, but you also get that sensitivity. When you have a large number of voters, the sensitivity isn't quite as, as important there. And so having a large number of voters tends to compensate for that lack of some sensitivity within the, the voting expression. Because you have lots of voters and they kind of have a distribution of how strongly they like something. And it tends to be the case that the thing that people kind of like the most intensely is also the thing that most people are going to prefer. That's right. Yeah. Interesting. So why not use this score voting? So you were saying approval voting is basically like score voting, except that you only get two scores that you can give everyone five stars or zero stars. Why, why not allow all of these kind of gradients of, of expression for every candidate? Yeah. And so the, the reason that we push approval voting so hard instead of score voting is that with approval voting, we see that as being easier to implement as a practical sense. So the ballots look virtually the same, except that the directions tell you you can choose more than one instead of just one. And that's pretty much it. So uh, whereas with score voting, you'd have to change the ballot. You may have to tweak the voting machines a bit more if you're using a a voting machine. But with approval voting, the ability to implement it is very simple. And the education campaign needed uh, for that is not the same as should you be proposing another voting method that's more complicated, like whether it be score voting or instant runoff voting or another voting method. With with score voting, wouldn't there be a really strong temptation to kind of bury all of the candidates who you don't like that much? So just to give everyone who you kind of dislike zero stars out of five to, to make to, like, to ensure that there's like you're not giving them any help to get elected. Yeah, yeah. So the, so some other tactics can appear uh, under score voting because of the way that you're allowed to express your ballot. So say you're in like a candidate, say one out of five, but they look like they may be somewhat competitive and you may bury that candidate, that's a particular tactic they can use under score voting. 
But uh, while using that tactic, like we would argue that the types of results that would create wouldn't be as devastating as the types of anomalies that could occur under different voting methods. Okay, interesting. And, and so the reason to go for approval is just that it's more straightforward and people can understand it and it's more likely to get up. That's right. Cool. Okay, so we've been through approval voting, score voting, single transferable vote. Uh, are there any other big candidates for uh, voting reform? Uh, I think those are some of the, the big ones. We spoke a bit about instant runoff voting. Single transferable vote is uh, a proportional voting method uh, that's typically used for for districts. Yeah, the, the multi, multi-member districts. Yeah, yeah. And, and one important thing about, say, like we're talking about using a proportional method within a district uh, that's electing multiple people at the same time, it's also important to keep in mind the uh, number of people that you're electing at the same time. So if the number of people that you're electing at the same time is, say, three, well, the proportionality is going to be worse. So there, in order to get to guarantee a seat, you're going to need 25% of the uh, of the vote using a single transferable vote method of when three people are elected. And that uses something called the droop formula in order to figure out what that is. But proportional methods, when you have more people being elected at the same time, you tend to get more proportionality, which is why some countries use methods that elect an entire legislature or parliament at once so that they can get more proportionality. And in fact, some people argue that that gives too much proportionality and that you get little tiny parties. And maybe we don't want to see that kind of uh, splintering going on. And as a way to compensate for that, with these huge uh, legislative bodies that are using a proportional method in order to compensate that, they may say, okay, well, in order to get elected, you need to at least have 5% of percent of support in order to be able to get someone into office. Um, So that's a way of getting more of that proportionality uh, while at the same time avoiding like uh, that kind of super splintering effect. Mm. So uh, what makes the the voting method specifically an an important target as opposed to to other kind of reforms that you might have of, of a political system? Well, a voting method is really unique in the way that its role is played within electoral politics. And so when I say that, uh, we're always, like as citizens, we have all these opinions about what policies should be, who should be in government. And while we're doing all these things to express ourselves, whether it's going and sharing things with friends, going to a protest, or lobbying our representatives, they don't really don't have to listen to any of that. Uh, the only thing that they are forced to listen to is our vote. Uh, that's one time when they don't have a say in the matter. Uh, if we cast our votes a certain way, and according to the voting method, it produces a particular result, they, they can't ignore that. They have to abide by that. And so this is our best tool. And because this is our best tool in terms of what it's capable of doing, we need to make sure that it's an effective tool in order to be able to produce the outcomes that we want. And so if we're using a voting method and that voting method doesn't allow us to actually express our opinion accurately or fully, then we've got a big issue. Uh, Because if we've never expressed that information, there's no way that information is going to be considered in the result for an election. And so because of that, we want to make sure that the voting method that we're using allows us to express information that is capable of being used to produce a meaningful result. And also that the information that we're uh, expressing under this voting method is accurate enough. So we're not just using these tactical voting elements that are being kind of pushed on us by the voting method that that's not occurring so that we can present accurate information that is actually being able to be used in a meaningful way so that we can get results that represent us. And if we're using a bad voting method, well, we simply don't get that. And then we then we just get these other opportunities that aren't nearly as effective as being able to cast our vote and not being able to have that ignored. Hmm. Okay, so if I had to summarize your views on this in, in just one sentence, I think it would be that first-past-the-post voting is terrible, 
Approval voting seems like the best alternative, but other methods, including instant runoff or score voting, are also better because um, a first past the post is so bad. Uh, is that attitude typical of voting theorists? And kind of is there is there a consensus among people who study this topic on on where we ought to move? Uh, interestingly, there is the London School of Economics and Political Science has an organization called Voting Powers and Procedures, and a while back they got a bunch of experts together and they were trying to figure out, okay, well, what we, we have all these voting methods out there. And you had this collective, this group was a bunch of world experts on, on voting methods. And they thought, well, we should probably, since we've got all these people together, we should maybe vote on what the best voting method is. That would be a kind of a fun thing to do. <laughs> how, how did they choose how to, how to do that? <laughs> yeah. So, they, they kind of agreed by consensus initially just to use approval voting for simplicity. And so, so that was the way that they were going to express their votes on all these different voting methods. And they had a number of different voting methods, uh, including score voting, instant runoff voting, first past the post, uh, Condorcet methods, uh, board account, all these different voting methods. And, and here we're talking about single winner methods. So that's the only thing that they were considering. And interestingly... So they were using approval voting, which meant that all these experts, they could choose as many options as they wanted. Uh, so if they liked a bunch of different voting methods, they could choose all those voting methods. And so I think out of the, the outcome from that, one of the more interesting things was, so there, there was a clear winner, but there was also like a, a clear loser in, in the bunch. And the interesting part about that, the, the loser, the losing voting method out of this group of experts got zero approvals. <laughs> can, can, I, can I guess which one it is? <laughs> feel, feel free to toss in your guess. <laughs> first past the post, right? <laughs> yeah, it was first past the post. And, and, and the top one was, was approval voting, I'm imagining? Yep, it was approval voting. Yeah. So, so, so an approval voting system approves of approval voting. It's very suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, instant runoff voting did do pretty well in, in, in that. Uh, mini in, informal uh, election, uh, but uh, approval voting uh, was able to, to, to beat it pretty solidly. And then everybody just destroyed first past the post, which is telling and a bit depressing because first past the post is used all over the world for single winner elections. And in the US, like we, we, we talked a bit about multi winner elections using proportional voting methods. The US doesn't do that. The US uses uh, winner take all. That is, they have an opportunity to have multi winner elections and use, say, proportional voting methods, but instead they put uh, people into individual districts and they elect them one at a time. And the way they, they elect them one at a time is typically to use first past the post. If you get lucky, maybe they use a runoff, but as we discussed already, uh, runoff is not going to uh, solve all of your issues. Yeah. Okay. So uh, it's, it sounds like the the reform that you're pursuing is 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 very popular among uh, among people who think about this. Uh, before we move on and talk talk more about the, the you know the potential benefits of voting reform, uh, you know who else who's working on it and, and how likely it is to actually happen, I want to talk about some other potential uh, changes that you could get in political systems uh, and and get, get get your thoughts on whether they're also uh, you know important targets for, for advocacy or, or research. So do you think proportional representation or cha you know, changes in how parliaments are structured, you know, how many houses you have and the size of districts and that, uh, you know, gerrymandering is another thing. Uh, is that kind of reform uh, tractable and potentially very, very high, very high impact? And, and maybe what, why didn't you choose to work on that instead? So the reason that we chose first uh, to look at single winner methods was the tractability in the U.S., there's a bit more modern history there. Although interestingly, in the first half of the 1900s in the US, single transfer vote was used in a number of cities in over a dozen cities and was uh, repealed in a number of them, except for really one for uh, city council, which is uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Yeah, in in Germany, well, in quite a lot of uh, European countries, I guess Germany most notably, that they have this kind of proportional representation system that allows for quite a lot of different parties and and these fairly large districts that elect multiple different candidates to to the parliament. Do you have a view on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing? Setting aside whether it's actually possible to get that in the United States. Yeah, I would I would tend to say that uh, compared to the United States, that it's a uh, better 
significantly better. One is in the United States, we have uh, a big issue with gerrymandering, which is just uh, politicians drawing the lines to figure out who their own voters are, which is like on its face, just kind of slaps of nonsense of something that just shouldn't be an issue. Um, and what's, what's interesting about that is a lot of people look at different solutions for that, whether it be ind- independent commissions or computerized line drawing uh, as a way to have that be fair. But it, it seems to be, I would argue, a bit intrinsic to single member districts, the type of bad outcomes that uh, that you can get with uh, winner take all. And it's not to say that it can't be worsened by gerrymandering and, and lessened by these independent commissions, but there are some inherent issues with winner-take-all. As an example, Canada has used independent commissions since 1964. And the last two elections in Canada, we saw what are called false majorities, which means that a party has less than half of the votes, uh, and yet it has more than half of the seats, which is something that doesn't make sense. If you get fewer than half of the the the, uh, the votes, you shouldn't get more than half of the seats, uh, and that happened in the last two elections. And we we would think that if we were doing some fair line drawing, that shouldn't happen, but it does happen, and it seems to be a consequence of winner take all elections. But and if you use something like proportional representation, you see that these false majorities or these manufactured majorities. You see that happen a lot less often uh, when you use a proportional system. So when I, I wrote on social media that I was going to interview, quite a lot of people got in touch asking about uh, increasing voter turnout as an alternative to doing voting system reform. Do you think that that's a, a valuable intervention and something that that is that can be done in practice? I think part of it is the like how you increase voter turnout, and you also have to ask well, why are people not turning out in the first place if. If you're giving them a tool that's not very effective by using what is arguably the worst voting method there is for single winner elections, then you're probably not going to get a whole lot of people excited uh, about the effectiveness of their vote. And maybe one way to increase voter turnout is to give them a real tool that allows them to cast a much more meaningful vote. Another interesting part about voter turnout is that if you think about this in terms of sampling, like so like when you're doing a statistical sample, for instance, you don't need to sample the entire population. You can sample a part of the population, and so long as that sample is representative of the population as a whole, it doesn't matter that you didn't sample everybody. The issue becomes when the sample that you have is not representative. And so if we have it so that systematically certain people are not turning out to vote, perhaps because we're giving them a terrible voting method and they're not feeling empowered, then if we create an incentive for them to to turn out and vote, then I think we're looking at a better scenario. And it's not so much there that the voter turnout is higher. It's that the people who turn out are more representative of the electorate as a whole. And another interesting idea here is that with voter turnout, We can also perhaps look at that as a proxy measure for the kind of faith that people have in the political system. And that if people aren't turning out, and this kind of goes back to the idea, well, maybe they don't feel like they are empowered as they should be. And even if they're not recognizing this as the main issue, perhaps they just think, oh, I don't feel like I have an effectual vote. Perhaps if they did have a meaningful way to vote, such as with a meaningful voting method, and they saw that as an issue, perhaps that would change their likelihood of turning out and also making it so that the people who do vote are more reflective of the entire electorate. Hmm. So a number of listeners also wanted me to ask you about possibilities for unequal uh, vote weighting. Like an example of that might be requiring citizens to show kind of an understanding of the electoral system in order to vote or giving extra extra weight to uh, to voters who, for whatever reason, are considered uh, wiser uh, contributors to the system. And obviously, that has a pretty terrible history in the United States as being used as a way of excluding people of color from from voting. But can, can you see any way that kind of unequal voter weighting could, could be used to, to improve the system? Uh, probably not. I would uh, much rather go the route of uh, more meaningful for voting methods. The, the, the idea of, of giving a purposefully giving people less weight, and there you're actually directly violating one person, one vote. Yeah, I, I can't see a whole lot of good coming from that. Yeah, 
I used to be, you know, interested in possibilities for, for doing this in order to kind of improve the the understanding, I guess, of, of the electorate. So you'd give people who had a better a better understanding of policy issues uh, more uh, more weight. But I, I think it's important to, to explain to, to to some listeners who might be sympathetic to this why, why I no longer think that that's uh, that's a very good idea. Basically, I mean, to begin with, it's a t- absolute political non-starter because pe- people look at that and they see opportunities for all kinds of mischief to basically exclude them or to exclude particular groups from being represented. And a vote is kind of two things. It's both uh, people contributing information that they know about what kind of policies would be effective. And it's also a whip that voters have to make sure that politicians actually care about their welfare. And when particular groups are like underrepresented or are not able to vote, or, or their votes aren't given as much weight, uh, then it tends to be the case that politicians spend much less money on them and, and just don't care about their welfare terribly much. So you can kind of see that with uh, Puerto Rico, perhaps, after a uh, hurricane that went through there. They, they don't get to vote, I think, for members of Congress, and they don't get to vote for president. And uh, that seems to be, kind of be reflected in the, in the low level of interest that politicians have uh, in, in taking care of their welfare. And uh, the, the US Constitution, I guess, uh, in the 14th Amendment precludes, I think, giving giving different weight to, to different voters and also precludes trying to exclude, prevent people from voting. Uh, and I think with, with good reason, because it's trying to make sure that politicians can't choose their voters uh, in this way in order to, to say, well, you know, people who share my views, uh, it's because they're smarter and, and they should be given uh, most of the weight. And people who disagree with me, it's just because they're misinformed and, and we should find ways of, of preventing, you know, preventing them from being part of the electorate. Yeah, you particularly don't want people designing the test being the same people who are already elected. Right. But, but I mean, who else is going to do it, right? <laughs> so, it, so it faces some, some serious problems. So I'll, I'll put up some links to, to discussion of, of that issue, which I think listeners might, might be interested in. But I guess this is the, the general issue of, of voter ignorance, because if, if you take surveys of the electorate, um, you find that often they have very poor understanding just of, of the most basic issues of how the, how the system is designed. You know, uh, I think most people don't know how many senators their, their state has, let alone any more kind of complicated information that they might need in order to, to vote wisely. Um, does that imply anything about voting reform? Does it suggest that we have to keep the, the system extremely simple because just most people are trying to live their lives and don't have much time to, to allocate to, to thinking about voting? I think in, in general, like if, particularly for, for single winner methods, I mean, if if you have a solution that, that works reasonably well and it avoids a lot of the anomalies that you like to avoid and it's simple, then you should probably go with that, that method until you get to the point where your electorate is more sophisticated. And then maybe after that point, then maybe you can consider more complicated uh, voting methods. And that's kind of a, a bit of a barrier for proportional methods because proportional methods, the algorithm component of that tends to be a, a bit more complicated. So I think with proportional methods, there's there's a bit more trust involved. So people are just looking at the the results and looking at independent verification in order to have the confidence in the, in the system. So that, that may be a bit of an exception to the rule, but you, you kind of need to give people, I think, a bit of experience with alternative voting methods, letting them see the improved outcomes that can occur. And then after that confidence level is built up, then kind of exposing them to more and more uh, ideal solutions as they become more comfortable with added complexity. Mm. Okay, well, let's return to assessing how good voting reform is as a cause from an effective altruist or kind of an 80,000 hour standpoint. And we evaluate causes, as, as uh, most listeners will know, on kind of three criteria. One is scale, that is how large will the benefits be? Uh, another is neglectedness, so how many people are already working on it? And the third is uh, tractability, which is like how likely are you to be able to, you know, how hard is the problem to solve? So, so let's take each of these in, in turn. Is there a way of measuring, you know, how large the the benefits would be from from having voting reform? Uh, is there any way that this has been done, and we can kind of see that see the benefits in terms of improved welfare? So, in, in terms of improved welfare, the concept that we're looking at is we have people who are elected, and these people who are elected are in charge of spending vast amounts of money, more than the richest of the rich can spend. And in addition to being able to spend these vast amounts of money, they also determine policies that affect our day-to-day lives uh, in very substantial ways. Uh, And so the the idea of choosing the voting method is that we're given an effectual way to be able to decide who sits in those seats that are able to make those types of decisions for us. And so that's the underlying concept for why this makes uh, sense as a target. 
Do we have a way of measuring, uh, you know, the benefits from uh, be- between you know different countries or different jurisdictions where where some of them have better voting systems than others today? So I mean, in some places you have first past the post voting, which which is particularly bad. In other countries you have instant runoff, a single transferable vote, or, or multi member districts. C- can we see kind of better governance in in the countries that have what we consider better voting systems? From what I've seen, so for instance, I believe it's in Pippa Norris's book, uh, Electoral Engineering, when she had looked at, for instance, proportional voting methods compared to non-proportional voting methods, one of the things that had stood out was, one, you had more women in government, particularly with closed party list systems, but another uh, thing that had, had stood out was uh, more egalitarian systems, so you had uh, less uh, income inequality uh, compared to uh, non-PR countries. So that's that's one area that I've read in terms of different types of social outcomes that have been different. So, so you think just because government is so influential in the amount of money that it spends and I guess the amount of harm it can do if uh, the people in charge of it make bad decisions, that having a system that kind of better reflects the, the preferences of the electorate is, is on its face it's going to be extremely important, even if we can't kind of precisely measure its value in dollars or you know how much better policy would be? I would say so, yes. Okay. So uh, how big do you think this could get? My, my understanding is uh, the Center for Election Science is kind of pushing for approval voting to get tested at a, a kind of a local level. And then I guess you're, you're hoping to get it implemented in uh, you know a, a lot more elections. How big could you see it getting? Could, could it like uh, end up being the, the system that we use to, to elect governments at the national level or around the world? I think so. Uh, certainly not immediately. But the simplicity of this and th- there are so many good things about approval voting that it's, it's a difficult thing to put back in the bag once it's out there. So uh, the kind of tactical approach for this is there's been decades of research on approval voting in the literature. Uh, so it's gone through the, the rigors of, of peer review and scholarly analysis. And so the idea from here is just to get it implemented at the local level, uh, show proof of concept, and then replicate that in other areas in the general geographic uh, area. And then from there, build to uh, other areas in addition to larger cities. And then once you have a certain concentration from there, you can start to target states. And the way the government is uh, structured in the US, uh, once you hit the state level, you can start to think about hitting the federal level at the same time. And perhaps at a certain point down the, the road, once there's enough saturation, I don't expect this to be anytime soon, but further down the road, you can potentially look at something like approval voting, being able to elect the president, um, which is due to some of the nice features about approval voting. Uh, so because approval voting is so simple, uh, it has some nice features called, uh, this one particular feature called precinct summability, which means that you can take totals from jurisdictions or, or states and then take those totals and then sum them up with other areas. And that makes it so that uh, you can have totals at the uh, at the national level. The other nice component of this is that if you have some states that are using, say, plurality voting, and other states that are using approval voting uh, for the way that they do uh, their votes, you can add those together in a way that is not really uh, practical with other voting methods. So that if you have some kind of some holdout states uh, during the process of moving towards. Uh, a system that uh, elects a president using approval voting, you can do that along the way. And there are different approaches for doing that. Like one approach right now is uh, of using a national popular vote with priority voting is using what's called an, an interstate compact, which is an agreement between states that has them sign on to allocate their electoral votes uh, once enough other states have signed on so that their electoral votes total 270, which is more than half the total electoral votes. And then they would just go ahead and uh, have their electoral votes go towards a national popular vote winner, um, regardless of what their state's national popular vote winner is. And it's difficult to have that kind of compact when an individual state is using a voting method other than plurality voting or approval voting. Um, So it becomes more uh, challenging to, to do that with other voting methods. Whereas with approval voting, uh, you can accomplish that and kind of have that same kind of tactic of using that interstate compact. And so that's something that's possible, albeit way down the road, uh, after being able to build up the, the base of support for this voting method at the local level and then building up to the state level and then federal level. 
Okay, so we'll come back to practical impediments actually uh, getting voting systems changed. But uh, I want to perhaps uh, pause for a moment and question whether actually this voting reform would would be good and whether it would improve decisions very much in reality. So why isn't approval voting already in use and, and why don't lots of people already kind of su- support this campaign? Are, are there potentially good reasons that you know, mo- most people, like ev- even most people who are very informed in the political system aren't talking about this issue and, and other institutions that, you know, have a self-interested reason to have a better voting system, like, for example, companies and, and you know, well, public companies that have to vote for members of the board. Wh- why why are almost all of these organizations uh, ignoring uh, approval voting if, it, if it's such a clear win? Uh, part of it is the, the voting method is really kind of an invisible issue. Um, so I imagine that there are a number of listeners who before this podcast, didn't really think about the voting method in and of itself or think about how uh, it could like really change things at a fundamental level. It's kind of like being efficient in water and not really recognizing what water is. It's just this thing that's always there. Uh, so I think that's really a big part of that is that the voting method really seems invisible. For instance, if you were to go out on the street and ask people, well, what's a voting method? My, my guess is that a lot of those people would just describe plurality voting to you and not be able to say, well, a voting method is a way that we uh, make a decision based on information that's collected and the way that information is calculated to produce a result. So they're not going to give you that definition. They're likely to say, well, you choose one person and the person with the most of those twins. That's what a, a voting method is. So rather than like, and there they're making the, the mistake of actually just giving an example of a voting method and not describing what a voting method is. So it's mostly just neglect, you think? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of invisibility there. And then uh, the other part just being that there are so many ways of analyzing voting methods, such as like how much utility does it offer voters on average? Uh, how often does it avoid these anomalies? How does it treat candidates who don't, who don't win? What kind of ballot complexity does it have? Does it encourage more people to run who otherwise wouldn't run? There are all these c- components that uh, are influenced by the voting method. And it's complicated to look at all of those and see how they interact with any individual voting method. And looking at all that is complicated. As a consequence, it becomes much more difficult to analyze that and come up with a solution for any particular circumstance. And as a result, you can kind of get this analysis paralysis as well, even with people who like to look at these kind of things. So has anyone ever managed to make an argument to you that gave you doubts about whether switching to approval voting w- would actually be a good thing? I haven't found one that's been particularly convincing. Uh, I mean, I've been thinking about voting methods for about 10 years now is when this issue uh, initially came up on my radar. And part of the, 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 the reason for not really having a lot of pause for, for instance, like things that might go wrong with using approval voting versus priority voting is that the current way that we vote with plurality voting is just so awful that it's it's such an incredibly low bar and approval voting just clearly beats it at all of these criteria that it's very difficult to have pause when the cop but when the alternative is so bad it's difficult to have pause hmm. so it's a lot easier to make an argument that maybe approval voting is not the very best but to say that it's not better is is a bit outlandish yeah yeah not better so so you're, you're looking at like the the worst voting method there is, and then you're asking about a really good voting method and trying to find ways that you shouldn't use this really good voting method versus this, what is clearly a terrible voting method. Hmm. Okay, so so what about this argument? Like approval voting and, and the other options that we considered do make kind of government more responsive to, to the electorate's preferences and views. But is that actually such a good thing, given that, you know, many people in the electorate kind of have crazy views and, and really don't know what they're talking about a lot of the time. Like maybe we want politicians to, to have more freedom to do what, what they think is right rather than more, more accountability to, to the electorate. I mean, to, to the degree that uh, the electorate isn't responsible for getting people in, in office, well, then, then, then that influence has to come from somewhere. And where do we want that influence to come from? Do we want it to come from vested interests? Do we want it to be kind of random? I would argue that those two are, are not great alternatives to having uh, the influence being the kind of national consensus. Yeah. I guess you, you can have an, a system where uh, it's very easy for politicians to get reelected so that they kind of just stick around for a long time and 
uh, they're, they're not very accountable uh, for, for the things that they vote for and don't, which is obviously bad it bad in some ways that they can they could do what they want even if voters in fact wouldn't like it if they knew if they knew what was going on but on the other hand i suppose if you think that the electorate is very poorly informed you might think that the judgment of this poli- of this kind of career politician uh, even if they don't have great incentives at least they kind of know something about politics because it's because it's their profession i suppose that this is one way it's it, like it's a bit of a perverse argument but it's one way that you could imagine that making politics more representative uh, of the views of the general public might not be so helpful as if you just don't trust actually the views of the public. So I think part of why some of this idea comes up in terms of, well, maybe the public has some crazy ideas and we really don't want them to have as much say. Uh, I think part of the reason that that comes up is because we're we're using a, a measurement instrument that is so bad at gauging the public opinion and we've been relying on that measure, measurement instrument to inform our views on what the public thinks. And so going back, I think part of the idea is we have perhaps a, a bad idea in terms of what the public thinks because we're using plurality voting to measure what the public thinks. And that is not a good measurement tool. Hmm. I guess, yeah, in thinking of this question, I was perhaps more influenced by um, this book, the, the Myth of the Rational Voter by Brian Kaplan, where he goes through... Uh, public attitudes on a whole lot of different economic policy issues and shows that they're completely at odds with kind of expert consensus with, within economics. Now, you could think, well, actually, this shows that kind of economists are biased and, and misinformed. Uh, but Brian Kaplan, and I suppose uh, I, uh, as someone who, to, who studied economics, are kind of inclined to, to think that, no, it's actually the experts who are right. And it's the general public that hasn't really thought about, you know, uh, benefits from trade so much. Uh, and, you know, and a bunch of other areas where there's there's quite a lot of consensus among among economists. And so if you think, you know, the public maybe has better incentives to figure out what's in their interest, but each individual person is only putting in a fairly small amount of time, like studying these issues and experts, even though perhaps they're a bit self-interested, they, uh, you know, know their particular niche area very well and might might just have a more informed judgment about the consequences of different policies. Uh, I suppose, I mean, if, if, if you really buy that, then it could call for like all kinds of different reforms. Like potentially you could have citizens juries where you call up a, a small fraction of the population each year and get them to kind of intensely study the different candidates and the different policy positions that they take and hear from different experts about their views. Maybe this is something that kind of voting uh, system reform can't deal with. I, I guess I do have some doubts about whether, you know, ensuring that politicians are, are strongly held to account by by the electorate is is always an unmitigated good. Yeah, and, and I have heard of different ideas like citizen juries before. And I think certainly ideas like that certainly have uh, have a place in, in politics, particularly when analyzing complex issues. But I also think it's important to kind of go back and think of all the ways that a voting method influences the political landscape. So a, a voting method, it doesn't just it doesn't just determine the winner. It gives us a flavor for all the candidates involved. And on top of that, it actually influences what your options are to begin with. As as an example, in the 2016 election, Michael Bloomberg decided not to run in the election because he thought he was going to split the vote with Hillary Clinton and have Trump win. So so that's why he didn't run. Uh, So we have a voting method that causes people not to run because they're afraid of mucking up the election. And they, and nobody wants to be accused of being a spoiler uh, as well. And nobody wants to go in and think, well, um, I don't have the same kind of name recognition as other people. Uh, if people just hear my views, that's not going to be enough. They're not going to vote for me. Well, if you're using a voting method that gives people a fair shake, uh, that also affects the number of the number and quality of candidates that you're likely to have as well. And it's also likely to influence other types of policy too. For instance, in the U.S., the U.S. has some of the worst ballot access laws there are. You have to, in in some cases, collect uh, tens of thousands and in some states over 100,000 signatures just to get on the ballot uh, for some offices. And that is really just absurd. It's just a way of excluding competition. It is. And part of the reason that they're doing that, it's not accidental. And it's not just a matter of not wanting competition, albeit surely that that's likely one component. 
to to kind of back up again and thinking about when a voting method matters. A voting method matters when you have more than two candidates. Uh, plurality voting, even if you have a candidate that does really poorly, you can have a really poorly performing candidate change the election outcome merely by their presence. And major parties are aware of that. And they have a memory for third parties that have, uh, so to say, mucked up their elections, and they are not happy about that. And so they have a couple of choices before them. They could, one, change to a, another voting method, which you get into this issue of people who are elected not wanting to change the way that they're elected, or they could address the problem by uh, not having more than two candidates or making it less likely that more than two candidates are going to run. And that's been the option that they've taken in a number of circumstances. And they've, and they've taken that option by making bad access really hard to do. And so if we're using a better voting method, that's also likely to change who uh, is able to run the types of laws that we have governing who is able to be on the ballot. And arguably, if we have more choices, I would think that we're more likely to have people who would run who otherwise wouldn't. Some of those people being, say, people who are experts on particular uh, policy issues, say, more scientists, uh, more economists, more academics, who are experts on subject matter that are inherent to being able to have a proper governance or a governance that, 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 that runs well. And by having those people on the ballot, through the incentive of having a proper voting method, perhaps we'd see some of these other candidates winning. And as a consequence, uh, some of the uh, more mature uh, election policies that we would like. Hmm. So do you think that approval voting would result in a breakdown of the two-party system or would it consolidate it? Do, do we have a sense of that? I think it would help. In, in, in which direction? I, I think it would help to uh, encourage uh, more independents getting elected and more third parties. Uh, I suspect that it wouldn't have the same kind of effect as you would have with the proportional voting method um, because it's only getting one of those elements. So if we go back to Diverge's law, there were those two factors, one being the threshold to single winner voting method. So the threshold is always going to be hard. Uh, approval voting doesn't address that factor. The other factor there that it does address is that you can support your honest favorite now, and that's a big that's a big difference. So now, if you're a third party, you get that accurate reflection of support. And even if you don't win that first election, if you've got good ideas, you can build on that. And that's something that third parties simply do not have right now. But if you're using approval voting, uh, people can look at your policies. It doesn't matter if it looks like you're not going to win. They can support your ideas. And as a voter, you're incentivized to do that under approval voting, even if you don't think your candidate is going to win, because you want your candidate to have legitimacy. And right now, you have a number of candidates who are running or who otherwise would run that are not able to get that legitimacy or or fear that they can't have that legitimacy, uh, not because their ideas aren't good, but because the voting method doesn't allow that support to be reflected. Okay. On, on the other hand, though, it seemed like earlier you were thinking that approval voting would encourage the election of kind of centrist consensus candidates who are kind of moderately appealing to to everyone, which which seems like it might I guess you could imagine, you know, a third a third new party that was a centrist party that would then that would now do quite well. Is, is there is there a tension between the idea that it would encourage like a wider range of different parties to actually get members elected, and the idea that it would not encourage kind of extremist candidates to get elected? So approval voting tends does tend to elect more moderate candidates, as we've seen through polling and through just technical analysis. So we would expect that. What what other kind of strategy that comes up? Say, to say you're a major party and approval voting is getting traction and you have some other candidates who are getting to be more competitive, there are some ways to deal with this uh, if you're a major party. And this is a tactic that major parties have taken previously. And that is, if you see that a competitor is bringing a popular issue to the table, nothing keeps you from co-opting that issue. And with that issue being taken away as a distinction, well, now you can have that territory back. So from a major party's perspective, you can always co-opt those ideas. And from a voter's perspective, not a huge loss. I mean, because maybe this candidate that had this novel idea that was really good uh, wasn't elected, but why you cared about that candidate, the idea itself uh, was able to move on. 
Um, and so that's another idea. And that uh, something like approval voting, because of the way that it uh, more accurately reflects support for candidates, uh, even if the winner is the same, the winner's views may not necessarily be the same because of the way that approval voting can affect the dynamics within the election, uh, including how policy is discussed. Okay. So that, that's that's very interesting. I, I guess where I was going with with this question about whether it would break down the the, the two party system is uh, I, I, was, I was looking at, a, at another possible objection that you could have to, to whether approval voting is going to be good, which might be that yes, at the uh, uh, electorate level, it will encourage each member to be more reflective of the views of that electorate, and perhaps that will then result in a parliament that has you know, a wider range of different parties and for the parliament to be more reflective of the views of the country as a whole. But having a parliament that reflects the views of, of the country more broadly does not necessarily mean that the policy outcomes then from that parliament will be terribly reflective. And kind of an, an archetypal case where you can get a, a parliament that's that's more representative but uh, produces kind of perverse policy outcomes would be one where you have, say, three different parties, one on the, uh, say, centre-left party that has 45% of the seats in parliament, a centre-right party that has another 45% uh, of the seats in parliament, and then, say, a far-right or a far-left party that has 10%. And in order to then to govern, because it kind of you've got this somewhat arbitrary 50% threshold in, in parliament that you need in order to pass legislation, the, the, the far-right or far-left party ends up uh, having a very outsized influence because they get to choose which party governs and they can potentially have a lot of influence over, over that coalition. And potentially uh, squeezing the party so that there's really only two and they're both kind of encouraged to compete over the centre could end up being less representative of, of the full range of views within the country, but then the policy outcomes from the parliament could end up being more centrist than otherwise. Does, does, does that make sense? So th that type of dynamic tends to occur, like and kind of as you're describing, uh, with a, a multi-party uh, legislature or, or parliament. And some scholars have taken a look at this. So for instance, Douglas Amy, who is an expert on proportional representation and has written a lot about proportional representation in the US and comparing it to, to other countries. And uh, normally when you see these coalitions form with multiple parties, the, the vast majority of the time you're seeing like a, a smaller uh, fraction join a coalition with the largest fraction rather than say the second largest. So really, and, and you're saying that like somewhere around 15% of the time when that's not the case. So like the small fraction going and doing a coalition with say like the second largest majority, for instance. So most of the time you're seeing that coalition happen with the largest majority uh, within the, the, the parties. So uh, arguably, that's kind of what you want. I mean, in terms of what you would like to see happen the majority of the time, you'd like to see that coalition happen with the, the majority. And that majority is going to be more likely to work with whatever other faction that lines up with uh, its, its policy views. And that, and that coalition may change uh, to some degree based on the issue. Uh, we see that in U.S. elections all the time. Sometimes moderate Republicans join Democrats in certain issues and vice versa. And so this is something that we would likely see break down in, in, in some uh, in some cases uh, based on the uh, the legislation that's being considered. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm slightly clutching at straws here because because I like approval voting <laughs> and, and I like your ideas. But I guess if I had to envisage a future in which approval voting was widely adopted and then thinking, how could it go wrong? I think this case of where you get a breakdown of, or you get like a very wide range of parties uh, getting elected, something like you have in Italy or, or Germany, and then that not working out very well, like kind of the coalitions that you get that get formed and the policies get, that get chosen then at that second stage, uh, being not representative of the, of, of the country as a whole. That, that seems like one of the, the more plausible ways that things could go wrong. And it is, I mean, most people who I talk to in, in America, and I think the UK and Australia are very enthusiastic about the idea of having a wider range of parties and having parliament be, be, be more diverse. Uh, but I think if, if you look at how that actually works out in countries like like Germany or Italy or Spain or Sweden, it's it's a mixed bag. Sometimes it works well and sometimes you get coalitions that are good and sometimes you get pretty weird coalitions. And, and in Germany now, we're kind of seeing a case where there's sufficiently uh, many like far left and far right parties that the only way to, to form a reasonable government is kind of to just constantly have national unity governments of center left and center right parties, which in fact means that in practice, there's almost less choice for voters. So in terms of uh, parties and how approval voting influences that, so here when we're talking about approval voting, we've been talking 
talking about the single winner uh, form. So you can really take any kind of single winner voting method, plop a different algorithm on it, and turn it into, say, a multi-winner proportional voting method. But here we're talking about single winner approval voting. And uh, single winner approval voting is not a proportional voting method. Uh, and so I would really not expect it to generate that number of, of parties. You would see major parties have to be responsive, but I do not expect the the higher number of parties. And even like, and say, like I mentioned before, the for, for countries that do use proportional methods, they have safeguards against tons of parties. And some of those safeguards are, are having specific thresholds. Um, and so you can use those mechanisms to make sure that you don't get into a situation where you've got a bunch of parties that have less than 1% and yet they still have seats, for instance. Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good point. Okay, so let's move on to the question of neglectedness. Who else is working on this problem, uh, if, if anyone, in kind of academia and government and, and, and nonprofits? Uh, within academia, you have on our advisory board, uh, we have a number of academics, uh, Stephen Brams at uh, NYU, basically one of the major pioneers behind approval voting. We have other folks such as uh, uh, Jean-Francois Lasse, uh, also one of our advisors, working on approval voting. Uh, Mark Kilgore, uh, an academic in Canada, looks at approval voting as well as multi-winner uh, systems. And then there's just a whole slew of academics that are looking at um, uh, voting methods in general. So I think within the academic sphere, there is no shortage of, of uh, contribution within this space. Okay. So, so in academia, there's a lot of research on, on voting methods. What about like actual advocacy for, for, for changing electoral systems or voting systems? Uh, the other organization that pushes for alternative voting methods, uh, FairVote has been around for 25 years, and they are the main advocates for instant runoff voting. And they've had success, some success uh, getting that, that implemented. And other than uh, them, there's really not much out there in terms of pushing the voting method uh, itself, uh, besides uh, them and the Center for Election Science, uh, us. Do any people work on this in government or in you know parliamentary committees or anything like that? You can have um, some commissions that come up uh, studying voting methods within a locality. We've seen that happen before, sometimes at the state level, but that's that's about it. And and those organizations tend to uh, look to other uh, experts and nonprofits like uh, like ourselves. But then you run into the issue of like. Uh, uh, has this particular voting method been used before? And that kind of puts us back to why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, so it's a pretty thin field outside of kind of academic research into the theory of different voting methods and I guess some experiments with it. Uh, I, mean, I mean, is there anything overseas? Are there, are there other countries where this is more of a live issue that there's lots of groups working on? Uh, we haven't seen a whole lot with regard to single winner voting methods. Uh, we've seen, like, there, there are a number of different multi-winner methods in terms of how a government would elect its legislature or parliament. But uh, unfortunately, like when we look at other examples, we see a lot of first past the post, which is really saddening for executive offices. Otherwise, like maybe you see runoffs or instant runoff voting. And it, with other organizations, there are other international organizations that look at election methods that are that are nonprofits, kind of think tanks and um, organizations to help democracies get off the ground. But even when those groups have been at work, the, the depressing part is they keep pushing these really, really objectively bad voting methods when we're talking about single winner elections. That's that's really interesting. What yeah, why is it that kind of pro-democracy groups in general just don't, don't really care about this question of whether the voting system then actually like causes people to be able to express their views accurately? It's it's weird because they, they're certainly thinking about it with um, the legislatures themselves, but th there are some situations where you have to use a single winner voting method. So if you're dealing with an executive office like president or governor or mayor, like you have to use a single winner voting method. There's there's no way around that. And I don't know if it's just the kind of debate that's within uh, the literature about comparing these different voting methods that gives this analysis process where they say, well, we've been doing 
first past the post for however long, let's just keep doing that. Even though when you look at it, it's just objectively a bad voting method. Yeah, I wonder if it's, you know, people get very excited about democracy versus authoritarianism, but then these kind of details of exactly how democracy plays out is maybe just harder to get people emotionally invested in. And I suppose you've also got the question, like America's systems were to some extent designed in the 18th century. And, and now Americans, maybe just because they're familiar with them, are exporting them all around the world, uh, just because that's what they're familiar with. And that's what they assume democracy is. Yeah, it, it, it could be just one of those kinds of status quo biases where um, it's not something that we think about a lot. And we just say, well, like there's a model, other people have done it. Uh, let's just go ahead and do that and not put a whole lot of thought about it. Just kind of one of those invisible issues or things where people don't put a whole lot of thought about it because they don't appreciate the amount of impact that it can have by changing to an alternative system. Hmm. Okay. So it sounds like there's something in the order of hundreds of academics studying this field. And then there's a couple of nonprofit groups that I'm guessing have a budget in the, in the millions working on it. Is, is that about right? Yeah, that's, that's about right. And then I suppose if you were looking for kind of other resources that are going into tackling the problem, you might look at you know how many volunteers are there or like what's the general kind of support among the public of people who bring up the issue or contribute in some small way to advocating on it. And it sounds like it's pretty small there as well, just because most people aren't even aware that it's a it's a it's an issue. That's right. Yeah. At, at our organization, the Center for Election Science, one of the big jobs that I mean we have before us uh, is outreach and communication and letting people know that this is an issue. And we do that through not only kind of general communication uh, and digital outreach, but I I think also to the degree that we can convince organizations in a number of settings, including informal settings, to say, okay, if we're making a decision uh, that includes more than two choices, at least not use plurality voting. <laughs> let's, let's at least not do that. <laughs> and, and, it, and it doesn't have to be that hard. Yeah. Okay, so you're scoring pretty well on the, the neglectedness criteria. Let's move on to kind of tractability or solvability. So to start with, you've, you've already said in brief, but what does the Center for Electoral Science, what, what's your plan to get um, approval voting or, or some other um, voting system implemented on a, on, on a wide basis? So what we do as an organization, we, we look at different voting methods and using a number of different metrics, whether it be like how it tends to get a good uh, outcome and the way that it affects the election dynamics in general and different situations that a voting method may work well or not work well. But the types of strategy that we're trying to do is just using ballot initiatives. And while doing that, we can also be doing outreach so that uh, other organizations are able to make decisions not using uh, plurality voting. And because this particular voting method is so easy, they can be using this as well. And that while at the same time of helping other cities uh, enact uh, approval voting, uh, people can at the same time be using better voting methods, including approval voting, uh, in in their own personal lives, and just realizing that this is not something that's difficult to do, and yet you still get all the benefits. Mm. So, so if I read your website correctly, at the moment, one of your campaigns is to try to get approval voting used in the city of Fargo as kind of a, a trial to show that this can work at the city level. That's right. And, and I suppose, okay, once you've got an example there, then you guess you hope to take it to other cities and then to kind of the state level and then and then build up gradually as, as you can show that it works well. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We, we were pretty excited with that. So the, the way that Fargo had started out was they had started a commission that looked at uh, different voting methods uh, in terms of how they elect their council and, and, their, uh, and their mayor. And one of the people uh, from that commission had reached out to us and said, hey, uh, we're doing this and it looks like you do a lot of uh, research on this. It looks like you're experts in this space. Um, Maybe you could help us out. And through that dialogue, we were able to uh, bring up approval voting and see how it was received. And it looks like it's going to be a good fit for them. And so right now we have folks on the ground in Fargo that are kind of building support locally and we're there to help run an educational campaign alongside them. So really, like we see it as we're providing resources and then kind of based on who reaches out and who's 
interested within uh, different localities, we can work with them uh, as they go ahead and put the initiative on locally, and then we can run the educational campaign alongside them. Hmm. So, so how many staff do you have and kind of what's, what's their focus? Is it more on the research or advocacy side or, or, or legal, legal issues? So from the grant that we received from the Open, Open Philanthropy Project um, really puts us in a different um, space. So uh, initially we were a budget of about 50000 a year. Uh, which it's very difficult to do much on that on that budget. And only recently has the organization uh, been able to make it so that I'm working exclusively for uh, for them and, and being full time and consider uh, other uh, positions uh, as a result of this grant. And so right now I'm the only employee, but we are hiring two positions uh, specifically. And we're also looking at uh, a local campaign coordinator for the educational campaign in Fargo. So it sounds like it's quite hard to get a uh, voting reform passed by the politicians who are elected by the present system. So you're mostly going to go through ballot in- initiatives. Uh, kind of in what fraction of jurisdictions can you change the voting system with, with a ballot initiative? So about half of states have a ballot initiative process and uh, a portion of those states have what are called home rule which means that a locality can choose its own voting method without having to get permission from the state. And there are different ways of, around that. So like you could have the state pass legislation to give permission to localities, but that's kind of an extra step. So right now we're, we're, we're only kind of limited to states that offer this ballot initiative process within cities. So what do you think are the odds of succeeding of, of getting this voting reform in at least a few places and then getting attention elsewhere and trying, trying to build momentum? Uh, surprisingly really good. I think uh, from kind of a, an outsider's perspective, it, it may look at something like this. So, so for instance, with Inside uh, Philanthropy, they did an article on us uh, recently and looking at our, uh, at our mission and, and what our strategy was. And, and they were a bit uh, dubious about, being able to, about us being able to pass these initiatives. But there's actually a really good track record in the U.S. for passing ballot initiatives on single winner voting methods. So we expect the likelihood to be pretty high. So, so the way that we look at it is instant runoff voting has been passed as a ballot initiative in a number of cities. But we see approval voting as is, uh, is producing better outcomes and having better political dynamics compared to instant runoff voting. And it's also approval voting is so much easier. And so it uh, avoids a lot of those issues. So we see it as something, well, if instant runoff voting can do this, then surely a simpler voting method that produces good outcomes and has good dynamics should also be able to do this. Yeah. For, for people who are skeptical, can, can you give some cases where these ballot initiatives were passed and were, were they passed easily or was it, was it close? So uh, San Francisco uh, is one place in uh, Minnesota. It's been passed in Vermont, uh, in places in North Carolina, uh, Santa Fe, uh, New Mexico, uh, and, and albeit there, there have been some places where they've also been repealed because, like I mentioned, IRB can have some anomalous uh, results sometimes, um, and that can produce some anxiety from the electorate. Although, as, as a caveat there, so one thing, plurality voting is worse than instant runoff voting, so always keep that in mind. Um, but as, as a, a caveat, sometimes people don't have good reasons for their repeal either. It could just be that they don't understand the system or the political party that had a lot of clout didn't get its way as a result of the voting method and they kind of pushed up a fit and used its complexity as a way to kind of leverage their their objective. Um, so just because uh, a voting method gets repealed doesn't mean it's getting repealed for a good reason as well. Hmm. I mean, if this is so politically practical, then why do most places in the US and indeed most places in the world still use such a terrible old voting system? Uh, part of it may just be that some of the uh, more modern analysis, this hasn't kind of caught on just yet. And it, it seems like part of it is that kind of status quo bias. Like some, There's this really a, a annoying argument that like, well, we've been using this method for a really long time. It seems like the world hasn't burned down. Let's just keep using this method. And the, the mere fact that something has been used a long time is not an argument for it being good. 
Also true of bloodletting at one point. <laughs> yes, you can do terrible things for long periods of time. It doesn't make them good. I guess at at some point, do you expect to see uh, like if you started building momentum, wouldn't kind of the existing interests start mobilizing against you? So um, my understanding is that in in the UK's referendum on alternative voting, the two main parties, Labour and the Conservatives, uh, both organized strongly against it because they expected to to lose out if the voting system changed. And I suppose could you imagine a system where like both Democrats and Republicans start running active campaigns against approval voting to, but because because they prefer first past the post? Yeah, that would be. That would be interesting to see both both major parties uh, uh, attempt to do that. But one one interesting thing is major parties. Although we we talked a bit about empowering voters through approval voting, major parties do stand to have some benefit here as well, uh, particularly through primary. So we so the the Republicans like pretty vocal about not really being happy about the the candidate that that made it through. Uh, their, their primary. And part of that is like they had 17 candidates at one point. And so that is prime territory for plurality voting to, to run amok. So major parties really do have an incentive to use a better voting method themselves, if at the very least for primaries to make sure that they're able to advance a better candidate to the general election. And they can always ad- ad- adapt from there. But it's not always to their advantage to use this terrible voting method themselves. Yeah, I, so that's interesting that the the major parties could potentially become allies, at least for using this in the in the primaries. Are there any other potential allies that you could find that could might might have a lot more money or a lot more influence than you do who who could who could help with the campaign? So third parties and independents they they stand to benefit quite a lot. Other organizations that maybe they have particular issues that haven't been brought up because they perhaps the, the the flag bearers for those issues are third parties or independents and they're not getting the kind of sway. Um, so those types of organizations may also kind of join on for approval voting, uh, being that the rationale that if they're using approval voting and then they have a kind of a flag bearer, where that, whether that be an independent or somewhere else that can support that issue, that that issue is not going to get more support. So people that want to see their issue have more clout than it is under a two-party dynamic, uh, they may be supportive of approval voting just so that their issue can be heard more. Hmm. So what's what do you think is the biggest impediment you're, you're likely to face or the, or the biggest challenge? I would, I would say that it hasn't been used before. So that, that approval voting hasn't been used to elect uh, people to government offices. And that's not to say that approval voting hasn't been used at all. Uh, approval voting is used in organizations, mostly academic organizations, because they tend to appreciate the positivity of, of a good voting method. But th- this is also why we haven't targeted really the, the state level uh, with any type of aggression, uh, because we, we're inevitably going to get the, the response that, hey, uh, we haven't seen this voting method used before. Maybe after it has some experience and we'll start to be thinking about that. So the, the, the main impediment that we have initially is that uh, we haven't seen this being used for electing people to government office in the US. So getting getting it used for the first time might, might be the, the hardest step. But I mean, I'm a little bit skeptical about that because instant runoff voting has been used in quite a lot of places. So it's, it's used in, in, in many countries around the world, but it doesn't seem like people have succeeded in getting that implemented very frequently in the US or the UK either. It seems like there's just a just there's a lot of stickiness in voting systems full stop. Yeah, I perhaps optimistically I would I would say that uh, approval voting can have a bit more traction than instant runoff voting uh, with some success. And the reason for that is it's just so easy to do. Like with instant runoff voting like you've got new ballot designs in many cases because the algorithm is more complex. And because of the space it takes on the ballot, they have to truncate it to your first three choices instead of letting you uh, rank more choices. So there are just a number of advantages that approval voting has because of its simplicity that I see that as increasing its likelihood for tractability. Yeah, I suppose in, in the UK with the alternative vote referendum, uh, the, the main tactic that the main parties used to discredit it was just that it was complicated and different and confusing. And people often didn't understand how uh, instant runoff would, would work. Um, I think that that would be pretty hard, that would be a hard campaign to sell when you're talking about approval voting, when it's just so obvious that you just mark as many candidates as you like. Yeah, you, yeah as, as the uh, uh, naysayer there, 
your campaign would have to center around uh, convincing people that they can't add. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, I was a bit, I guess I was a bit surprised that the anti alternative vote campaign worked so well in the UK, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> maybe I'm a fool, but, but I am hopeful that people could understand approval voting. So you mentioned a bunch of places where uh, ballot initiatives to change voting systems succeeded. Are there a lot of cases where, where it failed as well that might indicate that this is going to be a little bit harder than we, than we hope? So the the areas in the U.S. where there's been a failure has been with uh, multi-winner voting methods. So trying to implement single transferable vote, there are some places where that's been attempted and has failed. It was attempted in uh, California and also in Cincinnati, Ohio, about 10 or 15 years ago. And both of those had failed. Uh, but when we're looking at single winner elections in, in the U.S., I mean, they've uh, they've been pretty good at being able to pass. I'm not aware of a ballot initiative uh, that pushed for a single winner uh, voting method in the U.S. that, uh, that wasn't able to pass. Is there kind of uh, an issue with uh, electoral reform or voting system reform where uh, like it's stable for a long period of time and then every so often it's kind of thrown, uh, the, the question is kind of becomes a live one again and maybe that's the time to strike? I mean, I think you see this with, with, with countries, right? That you have the political system is often very stable and then you enter some period of turbulence. <laughs> I mean, it, historically, it's often been kind of in, in revolutions or wars or something and then kind of everything is thrown into question again uh, and potentially you can rewrite the whole constitution and change the voting system at that time. Uh, but otherwise, it's quite stable. Uh, I mean, I, I guess another model for you could be uh, once once you've uh, shown that approval voting works to just be very opportunistic and kind of go anywhere in the world uh, that is currently reassessing its its voting system or its political system as a whole. Does, does that seem like a, a potentially sensible approach? Yeah. Um, so we're, we're not, I mean, at, at the moment, we want to make sure that we're not biting off more than we can chew. So we're keeping things uh, within the, the, the amount of space that, that, that fits our capacity. But in, in the future, I don't think there's anything that is preventing uh, us, say, sometime, quite some time down the road and being able to look at some other locality in another uh, city in another country and say, hey, it looks like you've had like some really big issues here, or perhaps they've reached out to us and being able to provide them support with uh, being able to run an education campaign to be able to change the way that they, they vote locally. So we, we don't see this as just a solution for folks in the U.S. This is, uh, this is really a solution for anywhere where you're electing an executive office. Yeah. I suppose also if you're choosing what movie to see or where to go for dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if that's a, uh, just, just off the top of my head, I wonder if that's kind of a way to get people to, uh, to be more enthusiastic and understanding of alternative voting would be to encourage them just to use it in their, in their everyday life when they're making practical decisions as a group. Totally. And so th there's that uh, with the small group decision making. Uh, also, contests are another big one. So, for instance, I went to uh, a Chile uh, uh, cook-off with uh, my girlfriend recently, and they were voting on the, the best Chile within this competition. And they were using a plurality ballot. So they had a meat section and they had a vegetarian section. Uh, and I was in the, uh, we were competing in the, the vegetarian section and each of them, like for each of the sections, you can only choose one candidate. And so when they were going around and showing the ballot and the, one of the organizers was there, um, I saw the ballot and like instantly I kind of pulled the person aside a little bit and, and I said, Hey, um, you, you know, you're, you're using the, the worst voting method there is for this chili competition. <laughs> Actually, because there'd be so many entrants that I imagine that there'd be an extraordinary amount of vote splitting, right? Absolutely. There are like seven or eight uh, candidates for each uh, each section. And so you're, you're basically just like, unless you had one chili that was just absolutely awesome, you're basically just kind of doing a lottery there when you're dealing that many uh, that many candidates with all that vote splitting. So your hope is to get approval voting kind of tried at the city level, but how would an election like that really prove to voters considering a ballot initiative to change their voting system elsewhere that approval voting is a better voting system? Like, how would they be able to look at, you know, what's happened in Fargo and say, yes, like, I want to repeat that? How would they even tell that it's a good idea? Yeah, so a voting method really kind of proves itself when it behaves in a rational way when there are more than two candidates but one thing to keep in mind when looking at a voting method is a voting method can choose the same winner uh, as another voting method in, in some circumstances. 
the, the voting method becomes important when you're dealing with competitive elections that deal with more than two candidates. And so those are really the elections that, that are important. So when there's an opportunity to select someone that wouldn't be a reasonable winner under plurality voting. And so one way to, to look at that is within a particular uh, locality that's using approval voting, for instance, is to have encouragement and have good education to say, hey, you can have a bunch of candidates in this election and it's okay. It's not going to muck things up. And to be able to show the reflection of support that all these candidates get, even when there's a competitive election, and to show how you don't have these kind of bizarre outcomes from people that nobody likes winning an election. Hmm. Yeah, I, I got to say, I, I kind of remain skeptical of um, the, the solvability of this problem. And and I think it's just the gut reaction that I have, because it's something that people could have tried to do. Uh, it's, you know, presumably, people have thought about changing the voting system, uh, maybe not lots of voters, but you know, people who understand politics well. And it just hasn't happened uh, in many countries for, for a long time, which just makes me wonder, maybe there's some kind of impediments to, to, to doing this that, that we're not thinking of here on the, and that I haven't thought of and asked you about. Did you, did you have any response to that? So the way that uh, this is normally done, like I mentioned before, is through ballot initiative. So if, if there was a kind of hidden impediment, what we would expect to see is a bunch of failed ballot initiatives um, and yet that's not something that, that we've seen. And so g- given that, it, p- perhaps that uh, should cause us to kind of step back and say, well, why haven't people done this as a ballot initiative? Well, then it's more likely a complexity issue, something that's just maybe not like on people's minds as, and going back to that kind of invisibility issue as well. Um, and then thinking, okay, well, are there groups out there that are interested in this and can do this. And to the degree that there are, and they're running these ballot initiatives, I think that's the, the degree that you can look at its, its tractability. Now, if there are groups out there who are out there doing this, and you just see failed ballot initiative after failed ballot initiative, well, then that perhaps you, it, it makes sense to look more down that road. Uh, how hard is it to get a ballot initiative up? Uh, do you have to get lots of signatures and of support? Uh, it varies depending on the city and the size of the city. Uh, with uh, Fargo, it, it's uh, a bit easier to get something on the ballot at the local level. But still, even when something is on the ballot, you still have to run an educational campaign alongside that. Yeah, I've, I've, I've put you through your paces here talking about the, the solvability of this problem and, and uh, whether it would be a good or bad thing. So you just received six hundred thousand dollars, or recently received six hundred thousand dollars from Open Philanthropy Project. Do you have more room for more funding? Is is there is there extra things that you could that you could fund if if the listeners potentially wanted to to donate more money to to the Center for Election Science? Yes. Uh, so one of the, <laughs> I'm sure that was a surprise answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, you could just say like you're going as quickly as quickly as you can, but yeah, no, no, make 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 your pitch. So one of the nice things about this is that it scales up well. Um, so Open Philanthropy Project really helped us deal with our budget for this year and really helping us create the, the foundation that we need in order to, to push forward. Now, in terms of scalability, we can be doing this at other cities. And so we're, we're starting at something where we see as low hanging fruit. Um, but once we have a good procedure and we have good staff experience and institutional memory to be able to replicate this, then we can target other cities. And doing that is not cheap. So here we're talking about doing it at kind of a mid-sized city. Fargo is about 110,000, 115,000 people. But doing that to, say, uh, several other cities uh, next year of a similar size, and then maybe doing it at half a dozen to to 10 cities uh, the the next year, and then targeting larger cities. Here, I mean, it it takes much more coordination and staff to be able to coordinate campaigns at... Uh, that kind of level, um, and to be able to run these education, educational campaigns at all of these cities, particularly as the population within cities uh, is, is larger. Um, we're talking about a higher cost because you have to uh, reach out to more people. So, so if you got, if, if you know, someone suddenly gave you $10 million, do you have a sense of how hard it would be to hire people to, to run these campaigns in, in many different locations at once? So I think we have a pretty good kind of hiring mechanism. So we there, I think we would just be going and, and targeting those individual locations and uh, identifying folks who have experience 
uh, running ballot initiatives and then having them be paired with uh, people who are already interested within the space on the ground. And one of the ways that helps us with that is we're a pretty friendly organization, so we coordinate uh, and build relationships with other organizations as well. And th- there are some organizations out there that have been a bit shy about uh, jumping onto approval voting uh, because of its lack of use in government elections. And so uh, once we're able to kind of get the, the ball rolling, uh, that helps us build uh, those relationships even further and help them become more public. So then it's not just a matter of us building up our staff and being able to reach out to these new cities. But now, once the ball is rolling more, we can be using the relationships that we're having with other people who are now on board with joining on with our mission, uh, given that that proof of concept has been demonstrated. Hmm. Okay, well, yeah, speaking of uh, hiring, let's uh, move on to a section where we can actually offer some kind of career advice to listeners who might be interested in, in working on, on voting uh, reform. I know that you're hiring for a couple of positions at the moment. Um, what are they and, and what skills do you most need as an organization in general? Uh, so right now we have a rolling deadline for two positions. Uh, one is Director of Operations and Programs. Uh, the other is Director of Philanthropy. And so I'll start with the Director of Operations and Programs. Uh, so that position is looking at doing a lot of digital outreach, so helping us with our, our website. Um, so at, at the moment, uh, if you go to our website at electology.org, uh, you'll, you'll see that it's uh, the, the work of a lot of volunteers and uh, to, to get it to, to where it is. So the this person uh, within this position would be helping us to contract out doing work for our website, helping our digital outreach, as well as being able to help us with uh, coordinating uh, programs, including being able to uh, help coordinate and uh, help with the strategy on these educational campaigns on the ground. Um, They wouldn't be doing the educational campaign directly. We would be hiring someone else for that, but they would be helping to coordinate that effort as well as help building internal strategy to be able to do the type of relationship building that we need to do with other cities, as well as to be able to strategically target what cities we want to be looking at next. So we've got the Director of Operations and Programs and the Director of Philanthropy. Are you going to be kind of hiring political campaigners as well? Or I guess, I mean, what about like researchers or people who have, you know, an academic background in understanding voting? Are those potential hires as you scale up? Uh, those are potential hires as we scale up. At the moment, uh, we rely pretty heavily on uh, some board members as well as our board of advisors. Uh, so we have some pretty, if you look at our Who We Are page on our website, at electology.org, you can see that we have some pretty heavy hitters in terms of our board of advisors. So we rely on them pretty heavily in terms of figuring out which uh, approaches we want to be taking in terms of particular voting methods and also being able to uh, analyze more deeply uh, different types of voting methods and their attributes. Do you just want to kind of give a brief description of the kind of person who would be a good fit for each of those roles so that someone who's listening uh, and, and, and would be a good fit uh, just I can't, can't help but, but realize that they should think about playing? Yeah, so with the director of operations and programs, we'd like to, for, for both of them really, it really does help to have experience within the nonprofit sector. Um, within the operations and programs position, someone who has had experience running complex projects that deal with coordinating uh, kind of a lot of uh, plates at the same time and being able to have uh, good relationships with people while coordinating all those tasks. Uh, that's the type of experience that we want to see. So if you've been responsible for coordinating other staff, Uh, within a project that has a reasonable uh, size budget. That's the type of experience that we want to see. Particularly if you you have experience um, with, say, political campaigns, ballot initiatives in particular, um, and understand those logistics, and that's going to be really helpful as well. Okay, so let's look beyond just uh, your organization to thinking about the problem area as a whole. And I guess... That's that's a bit difficult because it almost doesn't exist as a <laughs> um, as a coordinated group of people trying to trying to solve a problem. It's I guess mostly just academics who are studying it, and I guess might do some advocacy on the side. But you know, I, I suppose you would hope to scale up 
the, you know, the community that's trying to solve this problem to potentially become hundreds or thousands of people with, with significant budgets. What would you like people to kind of be studying today or learning today so that they will be able to contribute as, uh, as hopefully this, this issue gains traction? So I, I think uh, organizational management is really helpful. And also just experience within the nonprofit sector. So reading books and taking courses on uh, nonprofit organization are definitely going to be helpful. Um, there are some differences within the nonprofit sector compared to the for-profit sector that can be uh, material. And absolutely, that's going to be the case, for instance, with the director of philanthropy spot, uh, for instance, there we need someone that has experience not only with uh, the grant process, but also with experience with fundraising, such as uh, donor communication and relationship building from all the way from uh, prospecting and cultivation uh, all the way to um, uh, stewardship with, uh, with large donors. And, and it may seem too like, so one of the reasons that we're also looking at that director of philanthropy position is because it's really exciting when you have a large source of funding coming in because it means that you have more resources and capacity to be able to fulfill your mission. But just like any kind of uh, sector, um, you want to make sure that you have diversified funding streams because you don't want to have a lot of pressure on an, on an individual funder. And it just kind of makes sense from a, from a business point of view. So having someone come in that has experience within the nonprofit sector and is really understands that space is really going to be an advantage. And uh, in addition to that, kind of a, a side set of skills is uh, good scientific literacy and understanding uh, how to analyze information. So uh, having like even things like having a fundamental statistics background is going to be able to help with the type of problem solving and skills that you're going to need in order to be able to understand this space as well. So you need to be able to, one, be able to be good at dealing with complex uh, tasks and understanding the nonprofit sector, but also you need to have a reasonable ability to be able to understand the topic area as well. What about people who've been kind of involved in major party political campaigns? Wouldn't that give them kind of good good experience for potentially being involved in ballot in- initiatives in future and, and knowing how to kind of combat misinformation that people might try to put out? Yeah, I, I think so too. I think that that would also be the type of skill while not direct to ballot initiative, there are a lot of components there that are likely to be able to, to carry over for sure. What about having more people in academia or doing uh, more more theoretical trials of, of voting reform. It sounds like that's, in fact, where, where most of the resources are today. Uh, so, w- would there be much point in having even more people doing that? But and and is there the potential, I guess, to to trial approval voting, of, you know, through getting social science grants or something like that, in order to in order to prove that it that it does actually work in practice? Yeah. So, when we're able to implement uh, approval voting, uh, certainly being able to see the types of outcomes that it produces uh, is something that we're going to be looking at as well. So to be able to look at an election and see, okay, uh, this is what it looked like under approval voting. What would it have looked like under plurality voting as well? And there are some things that are more challenging to do because when you, when you change a voting method, uh, which I kind of alluded to before, you change the complete dynamics of an election too. So it's really difficult to say, I come along and say, okay, uh, well, this is how this voting method was going to look. How would it have looked with this other voting method? Well, you can do that, but you can only look at that in terms of that snapshot in space because had you gone back and said, okay, this election was going to be uh, conducted using a different voting method, well, you're changing the entire dynamics. And those are the types of challenges, I think, that political scientists and social scientists face when they're trying to study this this topic uh, within a particular setting. And so that, that's just one of the things that makes this difficult. I think, I mean, we have a lot of listeners, I guess, who are very inclined towards, you know, mathematics and philosophy and, and analysis. Is there any point having more, you know, theoretical uh, voting people? Or, or is that you know, an area that's been kind of studied out of all proportion to, to the actual application in the real world? I think that there, there are perhaps some angles to this that haven't quite been looked at uh, completely in, in the literature that, that people could kind of do some gap filling on. But really, one of the, the main things that we see is 
just not like we have overwhelming evidence that this method that we're using for single winner elections is awful. So like no, no amount of extra data is going to, we, we only need our confidence level to be at a certain point before we say, okay, uh, we've collected enough data. We need to do something about this. Uh, so in, in that respect, I don't think we need kind of more analysis, uh, but uh, th- th- there are other angles within voting methods, and particularly uh, once we have more elections being used with different voting methods, it's going to be useful to collect data on those elections and see how they perform uh, compared to others. So are there any other potential ways that people could contribute to solving this problem? I mean, maybe they could become like journalists or go into, into think tanks. Uh, are there any options there? I'm, I'm just kind of just trying to think of any other any other thing that we haven't considered already. Well, this, uh, this space really isn't talked about much in uh, the media. So cer- certainly having journalists who are interested in this topic and being able to communicate that uh, is going to be an advantage because the, the, the kinds of things that people think about are the kinds of things that they hear about from friends or on media. So to the degree that that becomes more of a popular media issue uh, is going to change the degree that it's on people's radars. And that's being on people's radars is really a huge issue because, like, like I mentioned before, the voting method really is an invisible issue despite its really extreme importance. Hmm. So you mentioned uh, to me before the, the interview that you were looking for, for board members for the Center for Election Science. Do board members make a big contribution and kind of what, what do they do for, for a nonprofit? Yeah, so within a nonprofit, you're kind of always looking uh, at uh, prospective board members. And we, we did just do a, a recruitment effort where we got a, a number of really good board members. Um, in terms of what people can are contributing when they join a board and the types of things that can help prepare them when joining a nonprofit board. So first, the kind of things that nonprofits expect when you join the board. So uh, normally there's a, a giving and fundraising component, which is helpful for device, diversifying uh, at organizations on restricted funds. But also, if you're coming in and you say you have a really good network of people within, say, the political space uh, or other uh, nonprofits that have similar missions, or you have another relationship with people within the, the, the polling industry, like those types of relationships are really helpful uh, because a lot of an organization's capacity is dependent on its network. And the board really plays a large role in expanding what that network is. The other components that uh, a board brings to the table, in addition to things such as uh, uh, advising and those other uh, responsibilities, are being able to understand a nonprofit framework, such as being able to uh, go through and evaluate uh, a nonprofit's programs, being able to uh, evaluate the uh, executive director, having being able to evaluate the board, and making sure that the organization is kind of staying on task as well. And, and you're also kind of an, an ambassador for the organization too. So when you're going out to conferences or, or meetings, you're really kind of a, a spokesperson for the organization in that situation. Hmm. So, so I guess ideally you're looking for someone who's a bit senior, who has uh, experience with managing projects and organizations and people, uh, and I guess ideally some experience with nonprofits as well. And I suppose e- even better than that, someone who also understands the, the problem area extensively. Yeah, that, that, that's right. And with, within the, the experience, it's also uh, helpful, particularly as an organization is, is growing, to have people who have had experience within a nonprofit that isn't say, just like a volunteer-based nonprofit, which is where most uh, nonprofits start, but also to have experience with uh, within a, a nonprofit that has a budget of, say, a million dollars or more where uh, their staff and more complex projects are being run. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, I guess what kinds of listeners should think about uh, talking about nonprofits, about potentially uh, joining joining their boards, and, and is that the right way to go about contributing? That you would approach the nonprofit, or uh, or should the nonprofit approach you? <laughs> I, I think in a, in a lot of situations, uh, approaching the the nonprofit is uh, is appropriate. And so, so if, you, if you're looking in this space and you're thinking, okay, well, uh, one way I can contribute is by joining a nonprofit board, and whether it's 
like considering our board or another board within a topic area that you're interested in, some things that you can be doing just to, to start are one, making sure that you have a good uh, network, uh, particularly a network that expands within the, the space that would benefit the organization that you're looking at. And also reading uh, pretty heavily on nonprofit governance and board structure is going to be really helpful because it, it can be really exciting to, to join on to a board, but then like at the same time, look at something and say, hey, well, like this isn't quite as exciting as the type of things why I would kind of want to join on the board to like volunteering to join on a particular project, um, for instance. But being able to go and be familiar with the uh, material in terms of best practices for nonprofit governance and best practices for um, within a particular officer position for a board or board structure in general, having that background and, and to be able to demonstrate that you have that knowledge base and preferably experience is going to go a long way and being able to demonstrate that you would be a valuable member for an organizational board. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's come back to talking about the problem area of um, voting reform. Uh, are there any kind of conferences that that people ought to go through if they're if they're interested in getting more more involved in this community, in as much as it as it exists, and kind of what people should they meet and how can they find them? Yeah. So uh, one really exciting opportunity that we took up uh, recently was our uh, chair uh, Janice Drew and I went to a conference called. Unrig the System, which is put together by Represent.us. And that's also another nonprofit I really like. They do a lot of ballot initiatives to deal with kind of anti-corruption uh, efforts. And so going to that, like, is a, that, that type of conference is really exciting uh, because you learn about all kinds of political activities that people uh, are doing and the types of mechanisms that they're using to address these problems, such as gerrymandering, maybe they're looking at money in politics, could be using looking at uh, voting methods, uh, internal corruption, checks and balances. There's just a number of issues. There's a, another conference that I think for networking purposes and also it's just really fun to go to in terms of learning about the political space and you see a lot of exciting people is uh, Politicon. And that's held in Pasadena, California, uh, normally in the summer months around uh, June and July. Excellent. Is there a, a book you can recommend for listeners who'd like to learn more about this topic? Oh, yes. Yeah, there, there's a, a really nice introductory book uh, on single winner methods called Gaming the Vote. Um, Gaming the Vote is by William Poundstone, and it does a really nice survey on single winner methods. It also does a lot of storytelling. So uh, you'll hear him go through the story of the 1991 Louisiana gubernatorial election, which there's, he puts in a lot of really exciting detail. And so it's a really fun one to, uh, uh, to go through. Um, so that's a good one in terms of single winner methods. There are some other scholars that are uh, really good within this space. Although there may be some kind of disagreements like on little nuances that are there. But uh, David Farrell, uh, he wrote Electoral Systems, which is a pretty good one. Douglas Amy, uh, he wrote a book called uh, Real Choices, New Voices, which is a really good history of proportional representation in the US. Um, and also looks at proportional representation in general. And he did another one called Behind the Ballot Box. And that one is a good one on um, kind of a, another survey on uh, on voting methods in general. Great. Well, then I guess guess just to finish, you know, given given the challenges that I guess confront voting reform um, and the fact that you're part of a fairly small community, uh, like what what keeps you really excited about tackling this problem and you know uh, waking up early in the morning to to, to send emails and, and organize everything? Well, I think the the most exciting thing about this is that it has a high potential gain. And it's pretty clear that if we don't do this, it won't happen. And at least not for a long time. And so uh, because of that, we're uh, working to produce a gain for for people who otherwise wouldn't experience the, the benefits of a better voting method. And that's a lot of people and that's a lot of benefit. So that's it's pretty exciting. My guest today has been Aaron Hamlin. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Aaron. Thank you. 
Just a reminder that you should check out the links we put together for every show we make to help you become a minor expert on the topics we cover. Kieran Harris produced this episode of the 80,000 Hours Podcast. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.